The regular meeting of the Minneapolis Public Works and Infrastructure Committee will now begin for February 3rd, 2022. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the regular meeting of the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee for February 3rd, 2022. I am Andrew Johnson, the chair of this committee. As we begin, I will note for the record that this meeting has remote participation by members and city staff as authorized under Minnesota statutes, sections 13D.021 due to the declared local public health emergency. The city will be recording and posting this meeting to the city's website and YouTube channel as a means of increasing public access and transparency. This meeting is public and subject to the Minnesota open meeting law. At this time, I will ask the clerk to call the roll so we can verify that we have a quorum for this meeting. Councilmember Payne. Present. Councilmember Wansley Warlaba. Present. Councilmember Vita. Councilmember Shuktai. Present. Vice Chair Koski. Present. Councilmember Bita. Chair Johnson. Present. There are five members present. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. Before we begin this meeting uh, today, I do want to recognize that it is Black History Month and we have been issued a challenge by our Fire Chief, Chief Tyner, to open up each meeting by recognizing a fact of uh, black history uh, at the start of these meetings. And I gladly accept this uh, challenge and think it's wonderful and want to uh, lift up the fact of Rebecca Lee Crumpler, Dr. Rebecca Lee Crumpler, who is the first black woman in the United States to qualify as a doctor, opening her own medical clinic in Boston and de dedicating herself to treating women and children who lived in poverty. She treated patients regardless of their ability to pay and often took no money for her work. So we are very proud of the legacy of Dr. Trumpler. Uh, so on our agenda today, we have a number of consent items before us as well as a public hearing. We will begin by first, uh, taking up the consent items and then we'll move on to our public hearing. There are five items on the consent agenda today and one receive and file item, which I will read for the record. Uh, the first of our items is authorizing a contract with Hennepin County for waste disposal services. The second is authorizing a contract with Gray Matter Systems uh, and uh, data acquisition uh, for, or, I'm sorry, for the GE Digital Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition System Software License and Support for the Water Treatment and Distribution Division. The next item is authorizing an agreement with Xcel Energy for electrical feeder replacement. The next is authorizing a contract amendment with All Phase Construction Inc. for additional catch basins and manhole repair. The next is approving the project designation for Luella Anderson Neighborhood Project Phase 2 and setting a public hearing for March 17th in this committee, and then receiving and filing the 2021 fourth quarter reports of traffic zones, restrictions, and controls. I will now pause and see if there is any discussion from our committee members on the consent agenda or any items that anyone would like to pull off for further discussion. Not seeing any questions or discussion, I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Wansley Warlaba. Councilmember Vita. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Vice Chair Koski. Aye. Councilmember Wansley Warlaba. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Chair Johnson. Aye. There are five ayes. That carries and the cons consent agenda is approved. 
Now we will move on to our public hearing. And I did want to make uh, a note before we get in for the consideration of the appointment of Director of Public Works that uh, this is a big moment for us. And I am honored and privileged to be here with my fellow committee members uh, in consideration of this appointment. It's big because this is the first appointment consideration of a department charter head uh, or a, a charter department head uh, for this term of new council members in which we have a majority of new council members. But it's also uh, bigger uh, than that because it is also the first appointment since the government structure charter amendment passed by voters. And so that has changed the relationship between the city council department heads and the mayor. And I will personally say, I think that adds more weight uh, to these appointment considerations. It is also a big deal because our Department of Public Works has been without a permanent director for more than a year. And that certainly has a consequence both for individuals such as our interim director, uh, Brett Jelly, who we are very thankful for his uh, service and leadership over this time, as well as for the department. And so it is uh, exciting to be able to consider an appointment today uh, for which uh, the mayor is bringing forward Commissioner Margaret Anderson Kelleher, MnDOT Commissioner Margaret Anderson Kelleher as his nominee. So uh, just a quick talk about the process for a second for this uh, so that both committee members and the public are aware of how we'll proceed. So in just a moment, I will recognize the mayor to introduce his nominee, and then we will move on to opening up our public hearing. Uh, we do have 37 individuals signed up to speak at the public hearing. There will be a two minute limit for each speaker and the clerk uh, will help us with managing that time limit uh, and, and cutting folks off uh, once we reach the two minute uh, limit. Once we uh, get through our speakers, then we will close the public hearing and turn it over to our nominee uh, to speak. And then after that, we'll open it up to council members for questions, comments, and discussion on uh, this consideration of uh, in appointment. And uh, with that, I will go ahead and recognize Mayor Fry to speak to his nomination. Thank you, Chair Andrew Johnson. Greatly appreciate your leadership uh, and specifically your work on this committee, which we recognize is so critically important for our entire city. A big thank you also to our interim director, Brett Jelly, who, as you mentioned, has led for the past year through some very difficult circumstances. And uh, my appreciation and thanks uh, on behalf of our entire city really goes out to you, Mr. Jelly. Uh, so under the former uh, Public Works Director in Minneapolis, um, in Director Hutchison, uh, we made some really significant strides towards becoming a city that puts people first in tr terms of transportation and engages in a, a route towards sustainability uh, for our environment. And with Director Hutchison's departure uh, to work over at the Biden administration, we do have a rare opportunity right now to appoint a new director for this very large and very important department. And we've heard from our diverse Minneapolis residents and, and stakeholders the importance of having a very forward thinking visionary leader who can quite simply get things done and will continue to define Minneapolis as a bold leader on clean, equitable and sustainable transportation for all. And that's the direction that we're going. And with that, I'm, I'm very honored uh, to nominate uh, the Minnesota Department of Transportation Commissioner Margaret Anderson Kelleher to serve as the city's next public works director. Uh, it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, this is a very big deal for our city um, to achieve and to, to bring in a leader like Margaret Anderson Kelleher is a big deal at a critical moment, especially when we have so much in terms of federal infrastructure dollars coming in. She is a person that can help navigate that money towards clear results that quite simply help people. Uh, she brings a deep expertise in transportation policy and finance and climate action, and of course, in organizational leadership and uh, look no further than her resume to see some of the acolytes. Uh, and as MnDOT Commissioner Anderson Kelleher led a team of more than 5,000 people uh, at the state level. Um, during her time as commissioner, she has also created a new office of tribal affairs to expand the agency's work 
uh, consulting with tribal nations, established the Sustainable Transportation Advisory Council to help reduce carbon pollution from transportation, and has worked to deepen relationships with community leaders and local governments across our state and our city. Uh, Margaret Anderson Culliver is an excellent leader. She is one who I'm proud to have uh, to move forward here as a nominee uh, to, to work and partner with at the city. Uh, and I do ask for your support and your vote uh, in confirming the nomination. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, council members for the time. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We appreciate you joining us for this and uh, sharing your comments and introducing your nominee. Uh, I will move on now to the public hearing. And before I begin, uh, begin with this, just a friendly reminder, uh, especially uh, uh, for those who this is your first public hearing. Uh, we have had the question uh, raised at this and other uh, public hearings as well. If people who are speaking are able to ask questions of the nominees, um, the public hearings are an opportunity for you to address the committee and you can address me as the committee chair as well as we are considering your comments uh, and thoughts in our decision today. So I will go ahead and uh, open the public hearing and recognize our first speaker, Megan Rogers, and uh, you can press star six on your phone to unmute and we will uh, then move on after Megan to Will Davis. And I will quick ask clarification from the clerk. Do we need uh, public speakers to state their address for the record in this forum? Chair Johnson, I think they just need to state their uh, name and an organization. Perfect. If they're representing one. Perfect, wonderful. Thank you to our clerk. Uh, for that clarification. All right, Megan, the floor is yours. Welcome. If you, uh, we can't hear you. So if you are on the line, Megan, please press star six to unmute. Not hearing anything yet. If Megan, if you are tuning in and anyone else tuning in, if this happens and we can't hear you, uh, just focus on uh, connecting up and then when we're transitioning to the next person, feel free to speak up if your number has already been called and we'll call on you uh, next if you did not get a chance to speak, but you were signed up. So we'll move on uh, to Will Davis and then Megan, if you are on the line or are able to join us, uh, after uh, whoever is speaking wraps up, feel free to jump in and, and say that you're here. So Will, are you here? Star six on mute, Will. All right, we'll move on to speaker number three, Dominic Farstad, who will be followed by Robert Lilligren and then Frank Hornstein. So uh, Dominic, if you are on the line, please press star six to unmute. Dominic, are you here? All right, well, we will move on to Met Council member Robert Lilligren. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. Hello, my relative. I greet you in Ojibwe, my grandmother's first language. I am Robert Lilligren, a citizen of the White Earth Ojibwe Nation and a third generation Minneapolis urban Indian. I am the CEO of the Native American Community Development Institute. And as the chair noted, I am the Met Council member for the center part of Minneapolis, North Minneapolis and Robbinsdale. And thank you so much for this opportunity to address you today. And also thank you to Mr. Chair, Council and Mayor for the service you provide to our city. I am here to enthusiastically support the appointment of Margaret Anderson Kelleher as the City of Minneapolis Public Works Director. In fact, I just recollect that uh, back during my time on the council, I was one of the engineers of a charter change to expand the eligibility of the Public Works Director and not require it to be an engineer. And uh, we passed that at the council, 13-0 vote, imagine. And uh, 
and I think it was important to me because there's a lot of engineering that goes into our infrastructure and our public works work, and there's the context. It's in right the community, the people. And that's why I think Margaret is just a perfect candidate for this job. Words I think of to describe Margaret are fair, thoughtful, super intelligent, and inclusive. I've had the benefit and opportunity to work with Margaret during her time as a legislator, the Speaker of the House, as MnDOT Commissioner, and, uh, and I was a Met Council member during uh, Margaret's time as MnDOT Commissioner has been a high level mark in the collaborative relationship between our two agencies. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. And you heard of her excellent work with the Minnesota tribes in her role as MnDOT Commissioner. And I can speak to her work with the urban community as well, uh, specifically in the area of unsheltered and caring for our unsheltered relatives. MnDOT has a really interesting and particular relationship with the unsheltered who often are living on their right of way. And I think that can really inform some of the city's solutions to this uh, persistent uh, challenge. And we did a, at my day job, Native American Community Development Institute, finally here, we did a, a, we're a project with. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Thank, thank you, Council Member Lilligren. We really uh, appreciate you uh, being here to speak. Uh, with that, we'll move on to our next speaker, uh, number five, uh, Representative Frank Hornstein, followed by Scott Dibble, and then Joshua Christensen. Welcome, Representative. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and committee members. Um, I am very honored to give a strong, strong uh, supportive comments uh, for uh, Margaret Anderson Kelleher uh, to be the new uh, Director of Public Works. My name is Frank Hornstein. I uh, am a resident of Minneapolis and I currently chair the Minnesota House of Representatives Co Committee on Transportation Policy and Finance. And I want to just address two issues that I think would be very important for the committee to consider. Uh, in my role, I spend a lot of time on the issue of climate change and its relationship to infrastructure and uh, transportation. And I think that is one of the most, if not most important uh, issues that a new director of public works needs to be familiar with and address. Margaret Anderson Kelleher has done that in uh, her role as Commissioner of Transportation. Uh, as the mayor uh, had mentioned, she has worked on the Sustainable Transportation Advisory Committee, made many important policies and contributions there, and uh, really understands the relationship between transportation and climate justice. That is extremely important to me and I think many residents of the city. And secondly, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, as a legislator, I understand that there is an important collaborative relationship between uh, legislators in the executive branch and in your situation, city councilors and the executive and the mayor. And I can tell you that in her position in MnDOT as in the executive branch, she worked very well and very collaboratively with legislators. We were truly partners in developing and implementing policy. I know that she will work very collaboratively with you, Mr. Chair, and all members of the city council and the broader community. And so that is why I feel so strongly that in this moment, in this time for our city, uh, Margaret Anderson Kelleher will make an excellent director of public works. And with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. Thank you, Representative. We will move on to speaker number six, Scott, uh, Senator Scott Dibble, followed by Joshua Christensen and then Chelsea Glavis Caballo. Welcome, Senator. Do we have uh, thank Senator? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Perfect. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak in favor of Margaret Anderson Kelleher's nomination to be the next director of public works for the city. Uh, my name is Scott Dibble, as, as you said. I serve as the Minnesota State Senator representing District 61 and also serve as the lead DFLer on the Senate Transportation Committee. It also might be interesting uh, for you to know that I worked for six years as an aide to a city council member, Doray Mead, who served as the chair of the then known Transportation and Public Works Committee. We celebrated her life uh, last Friday, and I just want to say thank you so much to all of you for the beautiful resolution 
that you passed in her honor. It was displayed proudly at the memorial service by her husband and family, especially Council Member Kosky. Thank you for that. Um, so without a doubt, Commissioner Anderson Kelleher has been one of the most progressive, thoughtful, and responsive leaders at MnDOT I have ever had the pleasure to work with. In truth, I'm actually selfishly unhappy that she's leaving and thought I might actually say bad things about her here, but uh, I'll say nice things. She understands uh, the role of transportation. She understands that our built environment can either add to greater racial, social, and economic justice and contribute to improving our environment and climate, or it can do the exact opposite. And I'll just give a few quick examples. I know I only have two minutes. I have a lot to say, so I'll try to run through these. The first thing she did as commissioner, or one of the first things was to accompany me to a community screening and discussion of a documentary about the Rondo community and the history of its destruction by the agency she was taking over. Uh, Frank Hornstein managed, uh, mentioned the Sustainable Transportation Advisory Committee, very important work that's fundamentally changed and altered much of how MnDOT does its work. I serve on the Rethinking I-94 Project Advisory Committee, which is another demonstrable example of her commitment to changing the posture of MnDOT, recognizing past and ongoing harm, and really seeking the advice and counsel input of those who live the reality of I-94 every day. The same can be said of the response that she made to members of the community who, who have become active in the effort to think about Olson Memorial Highway, which was at one time a vital and bustling hub of the black community known as Sixth Avenue North. Is that it? Council Member Johnson, you're muted. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, that might happen a couple of times during this. So thank you, Senator. We, we appreciate you speaking here. Uh, and sharing your thoughts. We will move on to Joshua Christensen and then uh, followed by Chelsea Globitz Caballo and then Steve Kramer. Welcome, Joshua. Are you here? If you can hear this, uh, press star six to unmute. Joshua, are you here? All right, well, if you're able to join us uh, at another time during this call, we would welcome you to speak. Uh, we'll move on to speaker Chelsea Lovitz Gavayu. Welcome, Chelsea. Star six to unmute. Hello. Uh, Hello. Hi, my name Chelsea Glavitz Gavio. I'm the president here at the Minneapolis Regional Labor Federation of the AFL CIO, representing workers all across the city. Um, and we're excited to be here to advocate for the appointment of Margaret Anderson Kelleher to the public works. Um, there's just a few points that I would make is in, in the first one being that we're at a huge opportunity at, at across the roads of opportunity in the city around ARP funding, Build Back Better funding, state bonding dollars and funding of that nature. And we know that Margaret Anderson Kelleher is not only going to advocate for the best deal, not best deal, but the best outcomes for the city of Minneapolis, she's also going to be able to implement it. Because you're looking at so many unique layers of government and um, and and ways of implementation of these programs that it's going to take somebody with Margaret's like vast experience to be able to implement that well in the city of Minneapolis. Um, and honestly, we're at a complicated sort of like political point in the city of Minneapolis around how we are um, showing up at the state legislature and in the eyes of the entire state of Minnesota. And Margaret is somebody who can come in and make sure that we're not just a political volleyball for the rest of the state and that our needs are being met for the city of Minneapolis, um, which is part of the reason we're really excited. But most importantly, one of the reasons why we support this appointment um, is the stakeholder engagement. Um, through COVID and everything that our city has been facing in the last year and a half to two years, 
engagement needs to be a top priority for anybody moving into one of these um, positions. And Margaret has a track record of doing very good community engagement. Um, you know, working with philanthropy, working on major events, private sector, public sector, federal government. It, like, it, she just checks all those boxes. But the most important box is that she is not afraid to work with the frontline workers and be in the street. Thank you, Chelsea. And my apologies on um, mispronouncing for your last name uh, on that. So Glavitz Gabio. Uh, we will move on to Steve Kramer and our uh, number 10 on the list, Amber Nix is not calling in is my understanding from the clerk. So then after Steve Kramer will be Joe Wenker. Mr. Kramer, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members, and I'm going to do my best to avoid that uh, that buzzer sound, so I'll be succinct. Uh, I am calling in to support the mayor's nomination of Margaret Anderson Kelleher to be the next public works director. Uh, so many positive things have been said. I'll just highlight a couple of things from my perspective. And I, by the way, I'm representing the Minneapolis Downtown Council. I'm also a city resident, as is Margaret, and has, has been noted she's long been part of the civic fabric of our community, as Chelsea noted, really good and open to uh, engagement uh, across uh, many of our communities. So that's an important characteristic. As this, as Representative uh, Hornstein and, and Senator Dibble noted, she has served at the highest levels, and Robert Wilgren, highest levels of state government, both as an elected official and leading MnDOT. Important for the business community, Margaret led an important technology association, the High Tech Council for many years. So she is also familiar with the, the private sector and the business community. So just across the board, she's highly, highly, highly qualified. And I very much look forward to, to working with her on uh, important transportation issues ahead for the city of Minneapolis. I would just note as the mayor did a, a, a note of thanks to Brett Jelly for the uh, admirable job he did stepping in, uh, into the big shoes of Robin, Robin Hutchinson as interim director and, and look forward to also working with him uh, uh, continue on a continuing basis uh, along with the, the new uh, the new agency director. So thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Excellent. Thank you, Steve. We uh, next have Joe Winker, followed by Alex Satoulis and then Dan McConnell. Welcome, Joe. Hi. Hi there, this is Joe Winker. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members and Commissioner Anderson Kelleher. Um, my name is Joe Winker and I'm a resident of Minneapolis in Ward 7. Um, I don't have any fancy title or anything. I'm just calling in as a resident. Um, I have a question and this is my first time speaking at a um, public meeting, so I don't know if this is the format to ask a question, but I'm just going to go ahead and ask it. Um, so in the complete streets policy for Minneapolis, it states the following. It says, quote, Minneapolis is committed to rebalancing its transportation network by clearly prioritizing walking, taking transit, and biking over driving motorized vehicles in a manner that provides for acceptable levels of service for all modes, um, end quote. So my question is, if confirmed as public works director, um, will you commit to implementing this vision, especially when it comes to the reconstruction of Hennepin Avenue itself? So thank you. Thank you, Joe. And we appreciate you certainly asking that question. And uh, just from a procedural standpoint, uh, for you and for anyone else, it's certainly fair to raise questions like that. Uh, given the process or this format, we uh, don't have the nominee directly answer questions from the public. It will be council members uh, asking questions after the public hearing is uh, closed. But certainly appropriate if you have questions you are interested uh, in to uh, at least voice those for consideration uh, by this committee. So thank you. Uh, we'll move on to Alex, followed by Dan, and then Elisa Schuffman. Welcome, Alex. Are you available, Alex? Press star six to unmute. Maybe, maybe I hear somebody moving around a little bit. Uh, I 
I'm not hearing Alex though speaking up. So Alex, if you join later, uh, please feel free to make your presence known and we'll revisit you. Uh, now we will move on to Dan McConnell, followed by Elisa Schuffman and then Samuel Rockwell. Welcome, Dan. Uh, thank you, Chair Johnson and uh, members of the Public Works Committee. This is Dan McConnell. I'm the Business Manager of the Minneapolis Building and Construction Trades Council and proud resident of Ward 2. I'm um, excited to be here today to support my friend Margaret Anderson Kelleher for the appointment to the uh, role of Public Works Director for the city. I believe uh, Margaret is the right person at the right time for our city. Uh, as we all know, Margaret has a strong track record of uh, being a collaborative leader who can bring people together and build consensus. The Director of Public Works is one of the most important leaders in our city enterprise. Uh, they do a lot of things. They provide clean drinking water, they pick up our garbage, and they maintain our streets. And as our country is uh, finally recognizing the need for a serious investment in infrastructure, I believe Margaret has relationships and perspective that can maximize the impact of federal and state funding opportunities and to translate those uh, opportunities into improvements to our city that we can all be proud of. I'm proud to add my voice uh, to those calling for her appointment confirmation of her appointment and hope you will uh, do so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. We appreciate you speaking. And uh, before we move on to the next speaker, I will pause for a moment to recognize that we do have council member Vita here uh, with us via phone. And if you could just uh, voice your presence for the record, that would be wonderful. Council member Vita. Please press star six to unmute. Well, I know Councilmember Vita is here. Uh, she was able to add her name into the chat, but I know that uh, she's dialing in via phone and that would- Councilmember uh, uh, Johnson. Oh, there we go. I'm sorry, can you hear me? We can hear you. I am present. Perfect. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, so much, Councilmember Vita. And I'll also just note as folks, when you do the star six to unmute, you may also need to unmute your phone if your phone itself was muted in addition to the star six, because on our end, we've muted you and then you press star six to unmute on our end, but your phone may also be uh, muted as well. So that may be a, a helpful uh, strategy here. So we'll move on to our speaker number 14. Alisa Schuffman, uh, followed by Samuel Rockwell, and then Risa Hustad. Welcome, Alisa. Thank you, Thank you uh, Committee Chair Johnson, committee members, Mayor Fry. Uh, my name is Alyssa Schuffman. I'm a Ward 9 resident, and I'm the chair of the Minneapolis Bicycle Advisory Committee. I'm a year-round bicyclist, and I love Minneapolis, and I want it to be a place where people of all ages and abilities can enjoy walking and biking, and where we have a transit system that allows people not to own a car. Our streets have come a long way in the last decade, but drivers crashing is still an everyday occurrence in our city. I'm someone who has experienced car violence. In 2015, I was hit by a car. I had a traumatic brain injury. I was on crutches for months, and I still have gravel in my face from where I hit the pavement. And I'm one of the lucky ones. Too many people don't walk away from a crash like that. I don't want what happened to me to happen to anyone else in our city. That's why our great plans done after years of community engagement, focused on our most marginalized communities who often don't get to be centered in our planning processes, really give me hope. Today, I hope to hear a commitment to our plan, to the Transportation Action Plan, to the 2040 Comprehensive Plan, and to Vision Zero, reflected in our hearing, and that Prospective Director Kelleher will also express her support for implementation of these plans. We need a leader who will hit the ground running and implement all of those plans with the urgency that the climate, climate crisis demands, that our shortage of housing demands, that is demanded by this unique moment of being in a respiratory pandemic where our cars continue to pollute our air and make it harder for people to breathe. I'm excited and hopeful that today, Prospective Director Kelleher will make a strong commitment to these plans and actions, including support of 24-7 bus lanes and protected bike lanes on Hennepin Avenue as an important precedent for what we are committed to as a city. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And uh, we appreciate you sharing that very personal story as well. Uh, and I will note that before we move on to Samuel Rockwell, we have been joined by an earlier uh, uh, individual on our list who we are going to double back on and, and call on, and then we'll proceed with Samuel Rockwell afterwards. So uh, Joshua Christensen, if you could please unmute uh, and the floor is yours. Hello, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Perfect, thank you. I am Josh Christensen. I am a resident of Ward 10. And I'm just calling in to uh, congratulate uh, Margaret Anderson Kelleher on her nomination to be our public works director. I would like to say that during uh, this process, I would like to hear what her take is on the policies that have been laid out in the 2040 plan regarding transportation, as well as the transportation action plan that was passed by the previous council after engagement with the community, in addition to complete streets and the street design guide and uh, you know complete streets where we are prioritizing people who are walking biking and rolling riding transit over those the people who are driving a personal car in addition to that i would like to hear what her take is on the uh, hennepin south plan i would like to see what her take is on having full-time protected bus lanes along with protected bike lanes along the corridor and I would also like to know how she would engage with the Stevens Square community. I read an article in Southwest Voices this morning talking about how they've been working for years to try to fix the street lighting situation in their community. And I would like to hear that address. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for uh, speaking and for dealing with the uh, technical uh, challenges here. We appreciate you sticking through and uh, being able to share your thoughts with this committee. So we will now move to Samuel Rockwell. And then after Samuel, we have Risa Husad and then Katie Jones. Welcome, Samuel. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair Johnson. Thanks for the, uh, the chance to speak today. My name is Sam Rockwell, and I'm the Executive Director of Move Minnesota and a Minneapolis resident. Um, I am thrilled that Margaret Anderson Keller is nominated to be Public Works Director. I've, I've had the opportunity to see her work and, and work uh, on the Sustainable Transportation Advisory Committee, um, her work as MnDOT Commissioner, and I can attest that she does not shy away from tough conversations. Uh, she's willing to show up and ready to show up and that she's skilled at working across constituencies to move initiatives forward, and that's what we need at this time. As Commissioner Anderson Kelleher transitioned to Director Anderson Kelleher, I asked Public Works, the Council, and the Mayor's Office, all in collaboration, to embrace an approach based in optimism and possibility. Right, with the goals in the Minneapolis Transportation Action Plan are bold, and they'll require decisive and immediate action, but they are doable. That's really important, and it's necessary for our climate and community. I mean, take transit. Uh, for example, right, the Transportation Action Plan calls for a doubling of transit ridership by 2030. We know that's necessary for climate and for current transit riders, and we also know it's a big goal, but it's attainable. I mean, by way of example, in 2019, our regional transit system, so not just Minneapolis, carried 78 million rides, but in 1920, our transit system carried three times that number, 238 million rides. So we've seen transit transformed in this region before, and Minneapolis can lead, lead in achieving a doubling or tripling of transit service. We control the stoplights uh, where we can give green lights to buses, and we control the streets where we can designate bus lanes to improve transit and attract new riders. So Commissioner Anderson Kelleher's collaborative style and open mind position her well to tackle these challenges and to lead. So I'm happy to support her nomination and appointment at this moment in history and look forward to working with the council, the mayor, and Director Anderson Kelleher to deliver the future we've planned for and the future that Minneapolitans deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on, our next speaker is Risa Husset, followed by Katie Jones and then Jesse Lorenz. Welcome, Risa. Great. Yes, thank you. My name is Risa Husted, and I serve as Ward 11 Capital Long Range Improvement Committee Representative. I live in a transit-rich neighborhood in South of Minneapolis. I am really excited at Mayor Fry's appointment of Margaret Anderson Kelleher to be the next leader of our Public Works Department. Robin left big shoes to fill, and I want to thank her and Brett Jelly for their service to our city over the last several years. 
Um, and I've had the great privilege to watch Maggie engage engineers and community members alike as um, in her in her current role um, with equal respect and deference to 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 both um, regular community members like myself um, and and the engineers that she's been working with in MnDOT. Um, and I, I couldn't be more excited to work with her. I, I do need to hear a commitment from Margaret Anderson Kelher that she will continue to champion our recently adopted transportation action plan. Years of deliberation and community conversation brought us to identify that moving people over moving cars is our priority as a city. And we need to be acting on that promise going forward. The choices that we make over the next year will set a precedent for how we orient our city's built environment over the next 20 years. I look forward to working with the Public Works Department to build the city that the people of Minneapolis deserve and that our present climate crisis demands. Thank you so much for hearing my comments and I look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you. We will move on to Katie Jones, followed by Jesse Lorenz and then Richard Adair. Welcome, Katie. Hi, um, Chair Johnson and members of the, of the committee. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak regarding the appointment of the next Public Works Director. My name is Katie Jones and I live in the Wedge at 22nd and Bryant Avenue South. I love infrastructure and I love how it can make my and my neighbors' lives better. I'm an engineer, I'm a walker, biker, transit user, and driver. I've served on CLICS for the last six years and I've had the honor of serving on MINDAP's Sustainable Transportation, Transportation Advisory Committee with Commissioner Kelleher where we advanced the state's first vehicle miles traveled reduction, reduction goal. To meet that goal, dense urban areas like Minneapolis must accelerate VMT reduction and make it easier to take transit, walk, bike, and roll. And it's been a natural, natural progression. 50 years ago, we swapped buses onto Nicolette. 30 years ago, we did the same at and second. Over the last decade, we've swapped in wider sidewalks, bike lanes, more dedicated transit lanes in downtown and along university, and temporary bus lanes outside of downtown. Making these changes has been a natural progression, and for the sake of climate, equity, and safety, I hope for it to continue. I'm, I'm thrilled to hear more of Commissioner Kelleher's background from so many other speakers today. Uh, and for any nominee for this position, I hope you, council members, will ask and consider the following questions. First, to describe uh, the support for the city's existing transportation action plan, Vision Zero, and Complete Streets policy, and how well uh, this nominee plans to ensure that those are implemented. Second, the Hennepin Avenue redesign in Uptown, just two blocks from me, has been underway for the past four years through nearly 100 community meetings. Do you support the staff recommended layout for Hennepin Avenue? Third, the bike walk coordinator recently left the city. Will you hire staff dedicated to serving the needs of our road's most vulnerable users, those being walkers, bikers, and rollers? And lastly, what ideas uh, does she have to accelerate progress towards the city's goals and ensure everyone has safe access? access to destinations around the city. I urge you council members to find answers to these questions. Our city's ability to meet the climate crisis, achieve zero traffic deaths, and have thriving corridors depends on them. Thank you so much. Thank you. We next have uh, Jesse Lorenz, followed by Richard Adair, and then Anu Willey. So we'll uh, move to Jesse Lorenz next. And then I'm also seeing a note from the clerk that uh, Alex number 12 from earlier has joined. So we'll, uh, we'll insert you next, Alex. So Jesse, the floor is yours. Welcome. Hi, my name is Jesse Lorenz. Uh, I live in Southwest Minneapolis. Um, I, I'd like to second everything that the, the previous speaker just said. Um, I'd also like to ask uh, if the nominee will uh, respect uh, the policies that have been adopted by pretty previous city councils. Uh, currently on the bike route that I use to transport my children to school uh, on Blaisdell Avenue for four blocks, uh, uh, the project was not entirely completed. The bike lanes were not painted before the winter came. And as a result, those bike lanes have just been completely closed. And I now need to ride in traffic with my children, um, which is very unsafe. Um, and this is, contradicts the complete streets policy that was adopted by the previous city council at the end of December. And yet the public's works uh, employees are not following that, uh, what was adopted. And uh, I'd like to find out if the incoming public works director will request that their staff do follow those policies. Thanks. 
Thank you. We will uh, now go back for a moment to Alex Setsuli. Are you able to uh, unmute? Hi. Hey there. Welcome. I think I'm unmuted. You're good. Um, yeah, good to go. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Alex Setsuis. I'm a Ward 2 resident. Uh, thank you for having me on tonight, uh, today. Um, I'm calling today not to speak for myself, uh, but actually on behalf of my two young children who are growing up in the world that we're building right now uh, and who statistically are most likely to be harmed by vehicle violence in their childhood more than any other cause, as well as uh, the impacts of climate change long term. Um, I want to commend the council and the mayor for the strong commitment to ensuring people of all ages and abilities and all modes have safe, comfortable ways to get around our city. And I'm excited and hopeful that this nomination of Commissioner Kelleher will continue that commitment uh, and hope to see the city continue down the path of building infrastructure that aims to reach vision zero uh, for traffic deaths and minimizes the climate impact of our current transportation system. Uh, thank you again. Thank you, Alex. And my apologies for the last pronunciation. I think I got it right earlier, uh, but I apologize uh, for that. So uh, thank you for coming and speaking. And we will now turn to Richard Adair and then Anu Willie and then Jonathan Gershberg. Richard, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Okay, Sister Dick there, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, Thank you. I live in Bryn Mawr, no organization, just a citizen. I've lived and worked in the city for 35 years. And for 20 years, I've worked at a medical clinic near Chicago and Lake that serves mostly low income people. Uh, most of our patients take the number five bus. So I know something about how different life is for people who don't own a car. Taking the bus everywhere means you're always late when the bus is stuck in traffic and what a hassle it is to ride your bike on city streets in the snow. These things are related to our inexcusable racial differences in almost any statistic you can name. I'm also a bicyclist who served on citizen advisory councils, um, helping to build the loose line Kenilworth, Kenilworth and Cedar Lake trails. And I'll speak for my uh, grandchildren to second um, Representative Hornstein's comments about how important transit is in the fight against global warming. I've known Margaret since she was our neighborhood coordinator and understand why she's risen to the top in Minnesota politics. Smart, practical, organized, doesn't push her own way, listens, looks for common ground, knows how to get things done. You couldn't find a better person for this job. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. We will move on to a new Willie, followed by Jonathan Gershberg and then Matt Lewis. And it's been a while since I mentioned it, so I'll mention it now. If you, uh, when you're up, press star six to unmute. A new, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you for inviting me to speak today. My name is Anu Willie. I live in Ward 3 and I am currently a graduate student at the University of Minnesota. I get around the city by walking, biking, and taking transit. And I choose these modes of transportation because they're more affordable, more sustainable, and just make me feel happier than driving a car. As much joy as I feel biking and walking, I have dangerous close calls with reckless or violent drivers multiple times a week. I have thought too often on my way to school or to the grocery store that I might not make it home because of a driver. I don't think anyone in the city should need to fear injury or death while running errands or going to work. I believe our streets should be accessible and safe for everyone, regardless of race, age, and ability. Every single traffic death is preventable. We must design streets for people with safe sidewalks, protected bike lanes, 24 seven bus lanes, and improved bus service. These designs don't only make the city more livable, they save lives. We are living in a climate crisis and people of color in Minneapolis bear the greatest burden. Creating safe streets everywhere in the city is necessary for environmental justice and should be done in a way that is equitable. We have the policies in place to create a more sustainable and accessible system, such as the Transportation Action Plan and Vision Zero Action Plan. It is imperative that the nominee implements these policies that the city is committed to so we can save lives, sustain our city, and make it equitable for everyone to get around. Thank you. Thank you. 
We'll move on to our speaker number 21, Jonathan Gershberg, followed by Matt Lewis and then Amity Foster. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you, council members. My name is Jonathan Gershberg. I'm a Ward 7 resident in Lowry Hill. I'm a longtime renter, biker, and uh, transit user. Uh, third and the next leader of the Public Works Department, I want to emphasize the need to invest in infrastructure that facilitates walking, cycling, increasing the speed and reliability of public transit, and moves our city closer to achieving the goals set out in the Minneapolis Climate Action Plan. As someone who uses Hennepin Avenue South every day, I am tired of the near misses of speeding cars, the cramped sidewalks that make it hard to walk to the grocery store, and the bus lanes that are constantly used as a parking lot by large vehicles. But on Hennepin, we have a major opportunity to create things like dedicated bike lanes, dedicated bus lanes, widened sidewalks, and traffic calming measures that make our neighborhoods safer and easier to get around. So I would most like to hear from the incoming Public Works director, whether she supports the staff plan for Hennepin Avenue South. Thank you. I see the rest of my time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Matt. Or thank you, Jonathan. Uh, next up, we have speaker 22, Matt Lewis, followed by Amity Foster and then Jim Hagen. Welcome, Matt. Uh, thank you, Chair Johnson and members of the committee. My name is Matt Lewis and I live in a South Uptown neighborhood of Minneapolis. I chose to live here because it's an area of the city where I can get around on foot, um, by bike, and on transit. I'm excited to see the progress on street reconstructions the city has done recently, like Bryant and Grand Avenue, and we really need to continue this progress towards a climate-friendly and safer transportation future, especially on city-owned streets, fully city-owned streets like Hennepin Avenue. Hennepin must have 24-7 transit lanes, dedicated bike lanes, and wide and safe sidewalks for people walking and rolling. This should really be the standard for all reconstructions going forward. I urge the committee to hold Director Nominee Kelleher responsible for living up to the commitments that the city has already made in the Transportation Action Plan, the Vision Zero Action Plan, the Minneapolis Climate Action Plan, and the Transportation Section of the Minneapolis 2040 Plan. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. We next have Amity Foster, followed by Jim Hagen, and then Tony Kelly. Welcome, Amity. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Great. Yeah. So my name is Amity Foster. I live in Ward 3 and I'm a ward rep to the CLIC, the Capital Long Range Improvement Committee. I also serve on the Transportation Advisory Board of the Met Council. I don't drive and I do believe that everyone should be able to get around in our city without needing a vehicle. Public Works is one of the key departments in implementing the Transportation Action Plan. It includes a goal to have three out of every five trips be by walking, biking, or transit by 2030. The only way we can reach this critical goal is by prioritizing complete streets policy in every single public works project. To the council members, I hope that as you consider the nominee, you are asking her the hard questions. Will you commit to fully implementing the TAP, specifically the goal to reduce car trips, and how will you require the people who report to you to work to accomplish this goal? As noted by many, this is a powerful position. You can either maintain the status quo, implement slight change, or make decisions that will force discomfort in communities that are used to comfort. We need leadership that will address climate change and transit safety in systemic ways, not moderate changes. Thank you. Thank you, Amity. We'll move on to speaker number 24, Jim Hagen, followed by Tony Kelly, and then Elizabeth Popoliski. Welcome, Jim. Hi, thanks. My name is Jim Hagen. I've been a resident for many years in South Minneapolis. I'd like to thank Chairman Johnson and the committee for this opportunity. Assuming that Commissioner Kelleher is confirmed, um, she will be at least the second permanent director in a row to be coming from a transportation background. Now, without questioning her impressive administrative and public service experience, I urge the new director and this committee to keep in mind that the Public Works Department is about much more than transportation. It is also about our city water department, including the very aged and water distribution, uh, water distribution system that is turning high quality water from the treatment plant into unreliable and often rusty and damaging water in some of our homes. The 
problem is that the city has over 600 miles of original cast iron water mains, often 100 years old, that are highly corroded, resulting in discolored sediment-laden water coming into some of our taps. It's especially bad uh, in places like dead-end water mains, such as on my particular block. These are mains that don't circulate water. In this case, because of the corrosion and health purposes, these mains must be flushed frequently to make sure they are safe. And this discharges more sediment into our water lines. So I implore heeding the advice of Minneapolis's Capital Long-Term Improvement Committee that realigning or replacing of these highly corroded mains must be sped up and that water quality at the tap, not just fire flow, should be a priority. This failure to maintain the infrastructure in order to deliver high quality wa water is a problem that has been in the making for decades. So the problem is about the most essential public utility most of us can imagine, safe, high quality water. Water that's needed for drinking, bathing, laundry, and more. There should not be any blocks in the city that are deprived of this. So I hope this is a priority. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Next up, we have speaker number 25, Tony Kelly, followed by Elizabeth Popoliski, and then Jeffrey Oishi. Welcome, Tony. Okay, good. Uh, Chair Johnson, members of the committee, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. It is with great excitement that I speak in favor of uh, appointing Margaret Anderson Kelleher uh, to uh, head the Public Works Department. Public Works in Minneapolis is, like the last caller alluded, an amazing uh, section and, and, and provides amazing service for uh, the residents of the city of Minneapolis. Uh, it is my privilege uh, to represent 450 uh, public works workers at the city of Minneapolis as the business manager of Local 363 uh, and the chair of the Minneapolis Board of Business Agents, other uh, unions that represent public sector employees. I can think of no one better who can navigate the challenges that the city of Minneapolis faces uh, than, than Margaret Anderson Kelleher. Uh, and I say this with the caveat that she did give me a B in a, in a class that she taught at the Humphrey School. So even with that, I'm still very excited to, uh, to continue our successful relationship, provide good services for the citizens of Minneapolis, and also provide uh, uh, opportunities uh, for, for people who work for the city of Minneapolis and understanding that as an economic engine. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. All right, we'll move on to Elizabeth Popoliski, followed by Jeffrey Oishi and then Wendy Hahn. Welcome, Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Uh, my name is Beth Popoliski and I live in Ward 10 and I want to congratulate Margaret Anderson Kelleher, Kelleher for her nomination for this position. The current city initiatives that have been talked about a lot today the transportation action plans, Cleet Streets, Vision Zero, blah, 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 all of those, they are laudable initiatives. However, they have been put forth as an absolute not to be tampered with, no matter the impact on small businesses, those with mobility issues, or people who drive for any reason whatsoever. In the many meetings I have attended on public works projects, I have heard staff use this initiative to dismiss concerns as well as pragmatic suggestions for alternative designs brought forth by communities of interest, the residents who live along affected corridors, commercial property owners and small, small businesses, including those with the, including people with disabilities on these projects. As such, we have seen and will see more unintended consequences for those people. I am very hopeful that under the direction of Margaret Anderson Kelleher, that the concerns of Minneapolis residents will be fairly and equitably met, and I fully support her nomination. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. We'll move on to Jeffrey Oishi, and then Wendy Hahn, and then David Mackey. Welcome, Jeffrey. Thank you. Um, for uh, allowing me to speak. And um, my name is Jeff Oishi. I live in South Minneapolis. And um, I also wanted to sort of uh, reiterate uh, Jim Hagen's uh, concern about clean water. And I know that the mayor has talked about 
uh, providing clean water for all residents of, of the city. And um, in order to reduce the redundancy of my comments, uh, Jim, I know Jim made some comments and then Wendy has some comments. So I'll keep mine to this and uh, they will address more issues about uh, providing clean water and uh, um, the, uh, the changes that need to be made to provide that for, the, for all neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And my apologies on the pronunciation of the last name, Oishi. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for uh, uh, coming and commenting and speaking today. Next up, we have speaker 29, Wendy Hahn, followed by David Mackey, and then Carol Becker. Welcome, Wendy. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, the floor is yours. Great, hello, thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak. I'm Wendy Hahn, I'm a Ward 12 resident and live at the corner of 47th Avenue South and 38th Street. This corner is the location of what is called the dead end water main hydrant. This obsolete dead end main line is over 100 years old and has been delivering substandard water to our neighborhood for decades. Often my bath water comes out dark orange and never flows completely clear. It is full of sediment, rust, and iron. The corrosion plus the stagnation at the dead end raises levels of disinfectant residuals and other harmful things in the water. This water discolors my clothing, sheets, etc., stains my porcelain bathtub and sinks. It has also damaged my water heater, home plumbing system, and other appliances. I have purchased and installed numerous water filtration systems. The filters need to be replaced frequently because they clog quickly. These are all added expenses for the homeowners. But more important than the added expenses and aesthetics, I'm very concerned about the health implications of brushing my teeth, bathing, and drinking this water. I choose to shower so I don't have to view the yellow bath water, but breathing in the toxins which become airborne while showering is also unhealthy. It is very stressful to think I have been using this poor quality water for over 20 years. Some of my neighbors have chosen to purchase cart in and drink only bottled water. My neighborhood has brought this issue to the attention of the water department many times over the years. They acknowledge it is substandard water and needs to be fixed. However, they keep choosing to kick the can down the road, citing any number of excuses, and we are forced to accept these added health risks and expenses while continuing to pay our water bills. Ms. Kelleher, I know you are a climate champion and as the new director of the Department of Public Works, I implore you to please address the problem of dead end hydrants and finally correct this delivery of substandard water in Minneapolis. We all know clean drinking water is a human right and essential to good health. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, we will, uh, so we had David Mackey in queue next. I see a note from our clerk that David does not appear to be the, on the line. So David, if you're listening or if you're on the line, uh, let us know on mute or uh, if you're able to join later during this call before the public hearing closes, we're happy to uh, hear from you and I'll be sure to double back at the end to folks that I missed. So with that, we'll move on to Carol Becker who will be followed by Carol and Peterson and then Sigrid Arnott. Uh, Carol, the floor is Thank yours. you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm really excited about Margaret Anderson Kelleher. Um, I can't, I mean, it's like getting uh, Michael Jordan, you know, and um, Hank Aaron, but probably not Tom Brady because I don't like Tom Brady and I like Margaret. Um, I look forward to working with her. I think that we are uh, having to address some really important issues right now. The city adopted a bunch of plans, transportation plan, uh, the 2040 plan. The world has changed, however, uh, two major things. One is we had um, a racial reckoning in the city um, that said that we need to pay more attention to economic issues, especially helping people leave poverty and get jobs. The second thing is we've had the pandemic. During the pandemic, uh, transit, prior to the pandemic, transit ridership declined, local transit ridership declined 25% over the last six years. In since the pandemic, in the last two years, transit ridership, local transit ridership, the type, kind of service that we have in Minneapolis declined another 50%. Light rail transit has declined 75% and express transit service has declined 90%.
And so we need to reconcile in our city these new issues that weren't there when the city put together these old plans. That we need to figure out how to get people to jobs, how to get children to schools, how to get families together. Um, and we need a transportation system that does that. And the plan that we have today doesn't do those things. And so I'm really looking forward to Margaret uh, working with the community and I'm hoping I can get a commitment from her to help us work through how we can have a transportation system that will get people to jobs, that will get children to schools and recognizes that people are not riding transit anymore, that it does get to be four below and very few people can support their lives walking or biking. And so we need to have real solutions to getting people to the jobs that they need and the lives that they need and the wealth building that our city needs. So I'm excited to work on these issues um, and I can't imagine a better person for the city to be able to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. And now we'll move on to Carol Ann Peterson followed by Sigrid Arnott and then to Mara Kaiser. Carol, uh, welcome. Carol Ann Peterson, if you are available and on the line, please press star six to unmute. And then you also uh, check your phone in case it's muted. Not hearing anything at this time, so we'll be sure to uh, call your name again if you are listening and able to join us before the public hearing closes. So next we'll move on to Sigrid Arnott, followed by Tamara Kaiser and then Lisa McDonald. Sigrid, the floor is all yours. Hi, my name is Sigrid Arnott. I am a Minneapolis resident and a small business owner. I support the nomination of Margaret Anderson Kelleher for Director of Public Works, but not without asking for accountability and civil rights. Without a Director of Public Works with a record of putting equity at the front of every decision, we will continue to permanently build inequality into the fabric of our city. So let's look at the record. A recent legislative audit shows that MnDOT has recently progressed in the areas of workforce diversification and the crucial crucial record keeping needed to document exactly how far they are below goals, even when using federal funds. As a small woman owned MnDOT contractor with 75% indigenous employees, my crew should have been models for what the right of way workforce could look like. But if we were targeted by MnDOT, it has not been in a good way. Our experience with the current MnDOT Office of Civil Rights has been rejection and cover up of our civil rights complaints followed by lack of full cooperation with a federal civil rights investigation that followed. Instead of using the content of our numerous complaints to examine and correct dysfunctions, the current administration continued approach that has discredited victims, blamed us, and defended the violators. We expect the findings of intentional discrimination by MnDOT to be released soon by Federal Highways Administration, and we wish that stable leadership would stay there to address the findings. But Title VI goes beyond our case and fairness in the workplace. As JFK said in 1963, simple justice requires a public fund to which all taxpayers of all colors and national organs contribute, not be spent in any fashion which encourages, entrenches, subsidizes, or results in discrimination. This law should guarantee that negative effects are not purposely or unintentionally focused on minority communities. Yes. As the case of a proposed highway expansion in Dakota County shows, MnDOT has not put protection of Hmong farmers and their limited and precious farmland and perennial crops at the forefront of their planning process. Please consider the parallels to Brondo. Thank you, Sigrid. We will move on to Tamara Kaiser, and then I, I am going to note that the clerk says we do not appear to have Lisa McDonald, McDonald on the line, so we will be sure to double back at the end here. So Tamara, after you, we have Catherine Hill and then Rob Wellens. So, uh, hello. Uh, Welcome. Can you hear me? We can, thank you. Good, uh, this is Tamara Kaiser and um, I uh, also support Margaret Kelleher as our next director of public works. And I hope that she will listen 
not only to the interest groups, uh, representatives of whom we've heard many of today, uh, but to some who we haven't heard from. Um, I think, uh, first of all, of uh, the Uptown Business Association, for example, um, and who have been very clear about the concern that businesses who have suffered tremendously on Hennepin Avenue already because of the pandemic uh, and various other issues, uh, certainly crime being one and um, high rents being one, but uh, many challenges uh, to then add a challenge like this seems quite contrary to the very strongly stated priority in the Minneapolis 2040 plan that small businesses be supported. Uh, this seems like a plan that does not take into consideration, this is the Hennepin Avenue plan, does not take into consideration at all um, the very grave concerns of these business owners. Um, and you add to that the recent announcement that we're going to uh, build a huge entertainment center in the middle of Uptown, uh, inviting 2,500 visitors. That's great. Uh, Uptown needs to be revitalized, uh, but at the same time, we're taking away 92% of parking and uh, the kinds of solutions are people will like, walk, bike, or ride, uh, and they'll go park their cars in the few restaurants that happen to have private parking lots along the street and leave them there for three hours or whatever when they go to an event. Uh, this does seems very unlikely. Um, I would like... Uh... Thank you, Tamara. Uh, next, we have Catherine Hill followed by Rob Wellens and then that will complete our speakers list and then I will be sure to go back for the folks uh, that were not available earlier when called. So. Catherine, the floor is yours. Welcome. I hope I can be heard now. We can hear you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'll admit first, I am now technically a resident of St. Louis Park just across the border, but I previously lived in the Standish neighborhood. And my husband and I and our new son chose our location based on continued access to transit, bikeability, and the upcoming light rail line. Access to the park system is incredibly important to us, as is keeping our son uh, able to access his community without getting into a car. Um, I'm also an architectural historian, and I've studied at length the great benefits of investment in public works and infrastructure throughout history. Minneapolis was designed very thoughtfully to provide access to its parks and its green spaces for all its residents. Um, but high-speed roadways have served as a continued and growing barrier to those spaces for everyone. Uh, but particularly for those who are young, who are elderly, or who are otherwise unable to drive. Uh, neighborhoods without safe sidewalks, which I've experienced, and access to transit are inherently inaccessible neighborhoods. Minneapolis has lost a lot of its transit infrastructure over the last 60 years. Uh, trolleys were replaced with roadways, not only as an investment in transit and accessibility forward thinking and essential to meet climate goals, um, which many people have talked about, but it is also deeply respectful of our historic built environment. I'm very excited about Margaret Anderson Kelleher's transportation background, and I would just like to use the rest of my time to urge the city and its new public works director to continue its work towards creating safer, people-focused streets, pathways, and expanded transit access. Uh, that walkability and transit access, those are essential for lifelong enjoyment of the cities and access to its services. High-speed car-based roadways continue to be barriers for people who would use those services. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine, and congratulations on your new son. Uh, Thank we, you very before much. You, absolutely. Before we move on to Rob, we do have, it looks like Lisa McDonald joined uh, the room. And so uh, I will see if Lisa is available. Uh, if so, uh, please press star six yes, on me. Yes, I am. Welcome, Lisa. I am the a, floor is yours. I am available, Chair Johnson. Thank you. Would you like me to go ahead? Yes, please. The floor is all yours. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, 
My address for the record is 4241 East Lake Harriet Parkway, Minneapolis. I want to speak in favor of uh, Margaret Anderson Kelleher's appointment. I think she has an extensive transportation background, which would be wonderful for us in the city. I think one of her strongest assets is that she's been both an elected official and she has been administrative and staff side as well at the state. She knows how MnDOT works. She knows how the Met Council works. And I believe as the money from the feds comes through for infrastructure, it will come through MnDOT. And so she will be uniquely suited to help guide that to the city of Minneapolis. She's a resident of the city. And I believe that you can talk to her. I think she has a very, I think even though there's a lot of special interests who have weighed in on her appointment, she has an open mind and she will listen to all constituencies and citizens as well as work with the mayor and the city council. And I think that's really important because if we've seen anything in the last year is that circumstances change. So the best laid plans often have to be flexible. So thank you very much, Chair Johnson, for this opportunity. Thank you, Lisa. We'll now move on to our last registered speaker, Rob Wellens. Rob, the floor is all yours. Hello, can you hear me okay? We can hear you now. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Ms. Kelleher and members of the committee. My name is Rob Wellens and I'm in Ward 1 in Wade Park. In fact, I'm, in, I'm speaking from the most northeast block of northeast Minneapolis. Um, and there's been a project in the works in my area. It's called the 37th Avenue Reconstruction Project. And this is a section of 37th Avenue, which is also known as County Road D, um, between Stinson and Central Avenue. And there was on this project, what I would call poor communication as well as poor community engagement on the matter of a decision that had to be made regarding the placement of a bicycle pedestrian path along 37th Avenue. And this path could either be on the north side, which is Columbia Heights, or the south side, which is Minneapolis. And when they had a so-called open house virtual meeting last spring, they had already decided to put it on the north side of 37th Avenue, despite issues of safety, logic, cost, and common sense. If you could pull up, and I don't know if you're able to do this over there, but pull up um, the visuals I submitted. Do you know if you can do that? Uh, we do not pull up uh, items submitted to folks for the screen uh, when there's uh, speaking on testimony, but we will have that visual in for council members reference that will be in okay. uh, submitted comments uh, packet. So thank you for sending okay, that well, over. Good enough. Well, good enough. Okay, well, um, the, the visual points of contact, uh, well, one of the claims for putting the path on the north side was that it had more points of contact, indicating more points where the street would hit a bike path. And anyone pulling up that map can, any Google map can see that there's significantly more points of contact on the South uh, or Minneapolis side. And um, another visual I had was, um, I called it sidewalks. And if you look again at a Google map uh, satellite visual, you can see that Minneapolis has sidewalks that reach 37th street, whereas Columbia Heights does not. And they don't seem to be too concerned about wheelchairs, pedestrians and bicycles in, in uh, Columbia. So, Thank you, Rob, for uh, your comments. And uh, council members can also look at uh, those submitted comments as well uh, for checking out those visuals and the full comments. Um, now, before we close the public hearing, we'll quick double back here uh, just to make sure we got everyone uh, who is available. So our first three speakers signed up actually uh, were not available. So we are gonna call them in order. Megan Rogers. Megan Rogers, not hearing you. Uh, Will Davis, Will Davis, Dominic Farstad, Dominic Farstad. And just for the record, uh, you'll have to unmute uh, star six uh, if you are on the line. And I see a note from our, our clerk as well that they do not appear to be in the room. Um, I will quick uh, finish calling through this list though. Uh, just in case folks are joined up. Uh, Amber Nix. Amber Nix. 
David Mackey, David Mackey, Carol Ann Peterson. Carol Ann, not hearing uh, from any others and having completed our list of registered uh, speakers, I will go ahead and close this public hearing. And then I will invite our nominee, Commissioner Margaret Anderson Kelleher, uh, to speak. Welcome, Commissioner. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the committee members and to everyone who has taken the valuable time out of their schedule to come to this public hearing today. First, I want to thank Mayor Fry for putting my name into nomination to be the next director of Minneapolis Public Works. I also want to thank all the committee members for their time that we've been able to spend together getting to know each other, as well as asking about my leadership, my management, and my philosophy about public works. I want to specifically thank a few people who I had asked to come and speak on my behalf today. Uh, I want to thank Senator Dibble, Representative Hornstein, Met Council Member Robert Lilligren, President of the Minneapolis Regional Federation of Labor, Chelsea Gavitz Gabu as well as business manager Dan McConnell. And thanks Tony Kelly for speaking today. I'm sorry about the bee still. And to all the people who took time to ask questions, share your opinions and perspectives for the new director of public works. This is the only the beginning of that conversation, I believe. I wanna thank the past director for her leadership, Robin Hutchinson. And I also wanna thank interim director, Brett Jelly, as well as all of the team members of public works some of the hardest working people in public service. What? I believe that oh. leadership, oops, there's a little no, bit of noise is. in the background, what? okay. Um, I wanna tell you a little bit about what I think about leadership because I think it's important here. To me, leadership is a verb. It means that leadership is action. I also believe that no one person can embody being the leader at all times. That's an authority. My orientation towards leadership is the idea of a relay team with different members of the relay team taking the baton and leading a leg of the journey. The teams I've worked with and led in the past have found this to be a model that can lead to creativity, growth, and new ways of thinking. I hope to bring this leadership style to my service at the city. Although I bring three decades of public service to this role, and thank you, Dick Adair, for reminding people I was a community organizer with the NRP program long ago, I promise that I will not often be the smartest person in the room, most likely not. And we need all the talent, smarts, and hard work of the many people at Public Works and beyond the residents of Minneapolis to help provide the excellent city services and project delivery they expect. For three years, I've had the great honor of serving Governor Walls and Lieutenant Governors, Governor Flanagan in their cabinet. As the leader of MnDOT, I've had the honor to lead a dedicated group of over 5,000 public servants. In that work, we've been able to focus on the delivery of construction projects across the state, including the completion of downtown to crosstown project on 35W with the wonderful new orange line bus rapid transit. I'm most proud of some of the things I'm gonna mention. First of all, the excellent service during COVID-19 pandemic. At MnDOT, we were able to deliver all our projects in the past three years in a timely manner and largely within budget. At MnDOT, elevating the work of sustainability and public health division to address the climate crisis and repair the harms of past roadway building and expansions and do the work to make sure that we are embedding equity for communities and community members in all that we do. From employment, we are the only DOT in the US to be led by three women and diverse as well to equity for how projects and money are being deployed to repair past harms. MnDOT's work as a leader in the statewide, statewide tribal state relations training program and its nationally recognized program that focuses on tribal sovereignty uh, as well as cultural practices and systems. This is something that I will miss from MnDOT, my work with tribal leaders 
But as Council Member Lilligren mentioned, there is a vibrant urban Indian community in Minneapolis, and I look forward to continue to work with them. I think he was starting to mention something that I do want to highlight. He started to mention the newly installed wrap around the Wall of Forgotten Natives. With, and this was a project done with community. It's art that spells out words and images designed by the community that says, not homeless before 1492. This collaborative project with MnDOT and the urban native community is a step in healing. It's also finding a new use of right away, hopefully with a healing garden coming in the future. If you haven't seen it, I urge you to go see it at the intersections of Franklin and Highway 55. I also want to mention my work on speed limits because I think it directly relates to Vision Zero, the Transportation Action Plan, and Complete Streets. Working with former Director Hutchinson as I was the newly appointed commissioner at MnDOT, there had long been a proposal, and I think that Senator Dibble was going to talk about this. There'd been a long time proposal to allow local governments to conduct their own speed studies and implement lower speed limits, which the city of Minneapolis had desired to do. That happened because you had a commissioner who lived in a city on a street that often sees speeders, and also because I did not see why MnDOT was continuing to oppose the change to local control. In, we did make that change together in 2018. MnDOT took a neutral position on the legislation and it allowed for cities to do their own speed, control, speed studies and then lower the speed limit as Minneapolis has done. That is one of the key things that is important in Vision Zero work because we know that speed is never good in terms of a person who is walking, rolling, or biking. Personally, I've also been a very strong supporter of transit throughout my entire history, both as an activist, as well as a policymaker, and now as a person leading in the executive branch. That included when I was Speaker of the House negotiating an agreement to fund and build the Green Line between Minneapolis and St. Paul. It was not an easy story and I'm happy to share it sometime with you. In my role as MnDOT Commissioner, I've been an enthusiastic supporter of further investment in Metro Transit systems, as well as working with the 80 non-Metro counties that MnDOT works with to provide transit services and critical services during COVID-19 to the point of needing to be flexible in times of great change. Mr. Chair, many people have asked me why leave the state and come to the city? And for me, that is an easy answer. I will be sad to miss people at MnDOT and sad to miss some of these key relationships and work I've been doing. But for me, it's about impact and service. You see, the city is my adopted hometown. I grew up on a small dairy farm near Mankato. I moved to the city over 30 years ago. It's been my home. And although through my service, I often um, as a legislator served many of the city's interests in St. Paul for 12 years, I've never served in local government, the government that is closest to the people. I look forward to this opportunity. In fact, it made me excited to hear so many comments today. Everything from concern about very specific water issues to care for water overall, to the issues around walking, biking and rolling, and the balance to make sure that we have a city that is modern and can address the needs of all. That made me excited today. Cities like Minneapolis, are leading and that's another reason that I said yes to the mayor to come to Minneapolis with the focus on the climate crisis, which is our most important thing we can be working on. The adoption of the transportation action plan, the complete streets policy, the vision zero plan and the 2040 plan. I support all of these 
I would not be coming to be the director of public works if I could not tell you that I support the vision behind these plans. Minneapolis leads the country in the delivery of clean drinking water. And I understand today we have some places that we can improve. It also has best in class wastewater treatment as well as solid waste, uh, being able to process solid waste and the composting program. I think we can even do better here. One of the things that I've seen and heard about a little bit, and I heard it here today, is the need to tackle street lighting as a way to make sure that we bat, uh, tackle that backlog of street lighting replacement for efficiency and uh, energy efficiency, but as public safety as well. The ability to implement the Transportation Action Plan, Complete Streets Policy, the Climate Action Plan, Vision Zero, and the 2040 Plan is exciting and will have positive ripple effects for years to come. I'm committed to implementation of the TAP, Complete Streets, the CAP, Vision Zero, and 2040, working together with all of you. I look forward to working with all of you as we address the intersections of transportation, infrastructure, and racial equity. The mayor and each of you have made strong commitments to this work, and I look forward to using the Biden administration's Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and their Justice 40 initiative as another tool to repair the wrongs of the past and invest in the future that we can create together with community. I'm committed to working with all of you as we provide excellent city services, such as a possible pilot on snow and ice removal on public sidewalks in the high priority pedestrian network, as well as cultural corridors. Of course, this would need, be, would need to be funded to be delivered, but I'm excited to explore how we can do that. I'm committed to making sure we provide infrastructure and help our residents make the switch to more walking, rolling, and transit to achieve greenhouse gas reductions and make sure we're also engaging the public in conversations around the importance of the mode of transportation shifts to reach climate goals. The new Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act will help provide the city with new resources and opportunities to make our infrastructure more resilient to climate effects. It'll also provide key resources for both drinking and wastewater and also making infrastructure investments that will allow for the implementation of the Transportation Action Plan. I'm also excited to be working with our workforce and organized labor. I've had excellent working relationships with the unions that work within MnDOT, and I'm excited to continue those close relationships at the city. I believe we all stand committed to a workforce in public works that represents the residents we serve. That is an equity and justice issue, and I look forward to working with you to make sure that we are doing that work. What do you get when you hire me as your public works director? I hope you'll see you get a creative problem solver, a hard worker, a responsive public servant, a leader with a network of relationships across the state and the country to help us implement this work. Together, we can work together to deliver on the policy goals for the city of Minneapolis and its residents. Service is a key theme to my life's work. I look forward to continuing public service and helping you shape our city's future together. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members for your time today and your consideration. Thank you, Commissioner. We really appreciate all uh, your words and sharing your vision with us. Uh, in order to open this up for uh, discussion and questions for our committee members, I am going to go ahead and move approval of the nomination of Margaret Anderson Kelleher to the appointed position of Director of Public Works for a four-year term beginning January 3rd, 2022. And I will go ahead and see if any of my colleagues on this committee have uh, any questions or comments or uh, things they'd like to discuss. Please add yourself to yourselves to the queue. Council Member Payne. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Margaret Anderson Kelleher. It's really good to see you again. 
Um, I am really glad to hear about your commitment to the transportation action plan amongst all the other um, deep work that has been done around um, ensuring a strong future for our infrastructure. Um, and could I was just wondering if you could speak beyond those plans about your deep commitment to climate change and the urgency of actions that we need to take on climate change and how that's going to inform your approach every day. Mr. Chair, Council Member Payne and members of the committee. Um, again, this is one of the reasons I was actually attracted to come to Minneapolis. And that is because through the work of the Sustainable Transportation Action Committee Council, which um, you heard several people for reference, uh, the stack, MnDOT has been making great strides, uh, a recommendation of 20% vehicle miles traveled reduction statewide that is going through our public process right now came out of the stack. And through that work, what I realized was actually the most exciting work is happening at the local level. It is counties and cities that are leading the way. And I, for me, I'm a very action oriented person. I'm also a very hands on person. And I know that the climate crisis is our largest outside force that is going to change our world if we do not do better. And so really being able to come to a place where already there are plans in place like the climate action plan and the transportation action plan and being able to work together to implement those plans to get those mode shifts and to be able to have uh, folks, you know, really uh, do behavior change. And that is what it is. I mean, there's both the infrastructure and then there's the behavior change piece of it. And we'll be working side by side on that. But it's a passion of mine and I want to do even more. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Payne. Councilmember Vita. Thank you, Chair Johnson, and thank you, Commissioner Kelleher. Um, I don't have questions. Thank you for the meeting, the time you spent with me um, before this committee meeting and the uh, several conversations we've had. I was very pleased with uh, you know, your take on the Transportation Action Plan, the Vision Zero plans, and um, I think what got me was when you said, those are great plans, but we need some money. <laughs> I have <laughs> I have the relationships and um you know I want to get the money like they're on paper but we have to fund those so thank you so much for uh for that um I think you're the right choice at this time you know you understand this work at a high level uh, you've been doing it for so long um you you don't use buzzwords like equity you actually talk to the people who are going to be um, most impacted by decisions we make. Not only, uh, there's been a lot of conversations around bike and walking and rolling. I think that's great. Uh, a lot of my work have been in those same areas, but you get uh, what the department means as a whole. For someone who is uh, speaking to you from the north side, you know, one of my big questions and one of my concerns is, the, the north side feels like we don't have people who show up enough for us. And, you know, I wanted a commitment from someone who is going to show up for the north side. Like, we want our snow removed. We want our um, walkways and bikeways cleaned if that's what we choose to do winter, summer. You know, we don't want trash in our neighborhoods. We don't want uh, properties with 2000 tires on them, you know, so like I, I appreciate your commitment to the north side and your willingness to talk to me and others who live in this community. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much uh, for your time. Your uh, presentation was just superb. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Mr. Chair, if I could just add, uh, Councilmember Vita, thank you for those words. I want to uh, share, you know, I 
I live in the border area between North and South. We sort of say West uh, where I live. And when I think about that, you know, Sumner Library has become my library during COVID-19. I found it hard to go downtown to the Central Library and I, it's much easier for me to go to Sumner and that has really opened my eyes even more than it already had to some of the under investment that has happened on the north side in regard to infrastructure. And although Olson Memorial Highway is a MnDOT road, I look forward to working with the near north side and north siders on how we can revision that roadway to be safer for everyone. And so that's a exciting opportunity. And you're right, everyone in the city should have good services and should also feel that the city work is showing up for them. And so I look forward to working with you on that, making sure that we have the services across the city that are really needed. And when there are additional services needed, we put the resources in. Excellent, thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Councilmember Vita. Councilmember Wansley Warlova. Thank you, Chair Johnson. And uh, hello, Margaret. Um, Thank you also for your presentation today. Um, I have a couple of questions that I look forward to um, asking you during our public hearing. Um, the first one will be around the Green New Deal, which is um, uh, a movement and and priority that my office and I know many constituents across uh, Minneapolis is excited about. Um, and more specifically, I've met with uh, constituents in my ward who expect the city of Minneapolis to make serious commitments around advancing the Green New Deal. Um, they see the city's climate and transit action plans as solid benchmarks, but of course want to see more bold, you know, action to address climate change and racial inequities. Um, so with significant funding that's coming through the federal government, uh, government around infrastructure, um, and investment soon. Uh, what innovative actions do you see taking place in the next year from Public Works um, that will support advancing this Green New Deal? Mr. Chair, Councilmember Wansley Warbala, thank you for the question. I really appreciate that um, the work you're doing on a more hyper uh, hyper local uh, Green New Deal. I think there's exciting things that can happen in transportation and beyond. Uh, so the, the intersections between land use, because often uh, the land use around our roadways and bikeways and other areas can be utilized in new ways. And I think that's, you know, I can only point to something I, you know, maybe have done and this work uh, with the urban Indian community on the wall of forgotten natives, turn, eventually turning that land into a healing garden that the community will really be working together with. And it turns the land into something that I think is reparative as well to the environment. We know that one of the most important things we can also be doing is uh, providing carbon sinks uh, in, meaning where the carbon is going to go to. Uh, and so plant matter, the ability to also work with trees and greening and other plants is going to be important in that in public works. But I look forward to working with you and community members on how we can do even more. Um, we talked a little bit in our meeting about local food production. I think local food production is an exciting opportunity in the city. Uh, as a farm girl, I think that people being able to grow their own food or have easy access to food that is grown more hyper locally is important. And it's actually a resilience uh, issue as well to make sure our city is more resilient to the effects of the climate. Thank you for that. Um, 
and next question and actually council member v uh, raises and some of her comments um but around snow removal um sidewalk accessibility after snowfall is a citywide issue um and sidewalk sidewalk ice removal is also the most requested service for ward two um, the city of Minneapolis clears thousands of miles of roads for our cars during our winters. And of course, we would love to see that extended um, to our sidewalks where pedestrians also, um, you know, cover um, all throughout the city. Um, this also leaves those who are transit dependent at an unfair advantage. Um, and a municipal shoveling program has been brought forward by community to our office, and I'm pretty sure many other of our council member office as a way to guarantee safe sidewalks um, that are accessible to all of our residents across Minneapolis. With that said, would you support a mun municipal shoveling uh, program? So Mr. Chair, I just made sure I'm off mute. I have a double mute and sometimes I turn it on. So I was like, I think I'm off mute. Um, Mr. Chair and Council Member, I think the place to start, I did look at the study that was done already by Public Works and you know, it, it does seem to be something that we should be looking at first starting maybe as a pilot in places where we have that high frequency pedestrian network, especially the places that are connecting to transit, uh, to walking and bike paths, as well as making sure that the cultural corridors are another opportunity area for investment with a municipal shoveling pilot. Of course, this will take working with all of you in the mayor's office to identify resources. And the other part of that is being able to evaluate uh, how people feel about such a program. I think we have some idea how they're going to feel about it, but what difference does it really make in their lives as building support for uh, broader efforts? And so uh, both a pre and post study of and surveys of that work, I can imagine that happening with work together and I look forward to working with the staff and you to, to design something like that. Awesome, thank you, Margaret. Uh, next question, um, and it's kind of been interwoven in some of the comments that um, you've discussed already, but um, would love to hear more about your ideas around accelerating progress towards the city's goals around racial inequity, specifically um, in communities that fall under the green zones in both North Minneapolis and South Minneapolis. So I think that um, one of the exciting parts of the Transportation Action Plan is really it's highlighting of the places that we need to be doing better investing. And that's both investing in the infrastructure, but the people as well. And so I think there's some ideas there. One of the things that um, I know has been talked about in the city, but I am hopeful that maybe we can get accomplished in the next couple of years is having a training center that really is able to help uh, change the, the future of public works workers so that they are both uh, more reflective of the residents as retirements keep happening. My guess is, and I haven't looked at these numbers, uh, but Minneapolis Public Works is probably a lot like uh, Minnesota Department of Transportation. We have a big retirement bubble that is coming and we have a great opportunity there. And that great opportunity is to provide those, you know, really family sustaining jobs through public works. I think that's exciting. So I think it's both the infrastructure investment where there has historically been under investment and disrepair as well as the ability for us to work together to really have more folks who live in Minneapolis be part of that Public Works family. Awesome. And um, extension of kind of this question around racial justice, um, but honing in on a specific uh, issue that's been raised for a number of years, uh, particularly residents of East Phillips have been organizing for years around a vision for the rooftop depot um, and advocating for a community-led community urban farm. 
um, in East Phillips is a working class neighborhood with a large black and brown and indigenous population. Um, nearly one third live below the poverty line. Um, and the neighborhood also contains a formal federal superfunded site and state declared environmental justice area. It's been declared that. Um, and it also relies within the Minneapolis uh, Southside Green Zone. Um, as I understand it, also this area has been, because of that declaration, um, has been heavily impacted by concentrated pollution. Um, and largely this is what has driven this organizing around this uh, urban farm. So with that said, and knowing that this project has largely come through public works, um, can you commit to working with the East Phillips community to realize their vision? Mr. Chair and Council Member, I look forward to working with the East Phillips community on this. I know there's there's some some barriers yet to get through uh, to uh, deal with, so I just want to acknowledge that, that I know that the community has a couple outstanding lawsuits, and so those will probably have to be resolved. But I would tell you that um, in my time in the legislature, I worked very successfully with the East Phillips community when we were working on upgrading the park facility, East Phillips Park. And the ability to work with the advocates in the area to help open the eyes of people around the state to the vibrancy of the East Phillips community, but also the, again, underinvestment in the East Phillips community that then creates often a not virtuous circle for the economy and for success for your children and success for families. And so I think if public works can play a positive part in having uh, folks be more uplifted, that's an important goal for all of us. And so, you know, I know there's a little ways to go on this in terms of figuring out uh, detail, but working with the community and having good community partnerships with public works is important to me. And I hear it important to you and I have a commitment towards it. Thank you for that. And last question um, is around uh, Rethinking 94. Um, as the current uh, commissioner of the MnDOT, of MnDOT, you are aware of, of its Rethinking 94 project and Minneapolis like cities across the country are beginning to reckon with the environmental, economic and racial justice and equities that highway, uh, highways have caused. Um, and that in the backdrop of Minneapolis also being a city that has some of the worst racial inequities in the country. Um, so we know black and brown communities have largely and disproportionately been impacted by um, highways. Um, and communities all across Minneapolis, as well as my own constituents, have reached out to me about um, what opportunities are present uh, for restorative and reparative justice around um, this Rethinking 94 project and how that ties into uh, the Green New Deal. And with that said, um, while we understand that this project, you know, could provide better transportation options, um, and hopefully, you know, in our your your comments around working with indigenous communities and really supporting um, indigenous sovereignty, um, having this uh, project also be an extension of returning land back to impacted communities by its expansion and just overall construction. Um, with that said, would you be willing to support a freeway removal option for this project? So. Mr. Chair and Councilmember Wansley Warbola, I think that what um, on rethinking I-94, this is a, a long-term project. It's still somewhere between six to eight years away from any sort of construction or, or removal. And what I would tell you is I believe that one of the options that will be studied in the alternative study for the environmental impact statement and to successfully uh, be able to go through the NEPA and MEPA process is a removal or parkway option. Um, this has become an important part of 
modern and urban highway projects to look at what does that look like? Where do those 155,000 vehicles go? Or how would they travel through? And can we make a change? Maybe a bus rapid transit as well. So if this is the policy of the city of Minneapolis and it fits together, obviously being a strong supporter as the public works director to those alternatives is going to be important. Like I said, we are a ways away. It's a very long form that was set up here by uh, previous Commissioner Zelli to really engage community. And I'm actually excited that you are, you and your constituents are getting engaged in the process. Much of the focus has been, and importantly, on Rondo and St. Paul, but there are harms that have come to Minneapolis, particularly the Seward and the Cedar Riverside neighborhoods and how we are able to work through and, and find ways to reverse the harms that have been done. It's very important to me seeing the history of what has happened in the past. Awesome, that's all of my questions, but I do also wanna offer just a correction on my last name. It's Warloba. Um, Warloba. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, yeah. Margaret, for those answers. And we'll turn it back to you, uh, Chair Johnson. Thank you, Council Member Wansley Warloba. Uh, we will now turn over to Council Member Koski. Well, thank you, Chair Johnson and everyone on this meeting today. And I have a prepared statement rather than a question today. Uh, so I will be supporting the appointment of Margaret Anderson Kelleher as our next Director of Public Works. Uh, and this support comes for many reasons. I'd like to start by speaking to the experience uh, and the expertise that Margaret Anderson Kelleher will bring to the city of Minneapolis. Uh, Margaret has a BA in political science from Gustavus Adolphus College and a master's in public administration from Harvard University Kennedy School of Government. She's served uh, as the Speaker of the House of the Minnesota House of Representatives, as a trustee of Minnesota State Colleges and University, as a lecturer of the Humphrey School of Public Affairs, as the Executive Director, President and CEO of Minnesota High Tech Association, and as the Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Transportation. She's also served on a variety of volunteer community boards, including chairing the governor's broadband task force and serving as a member of the Minnesota State Board of Directors, the Greater Metropolitan Workforce Development Council, and the Textile Center Board of Minnesota. Her specialties include, but certainly are not limited to leadership, budgeting, problem solving, public policy expertise, STEM education, educational policy, computer science, IT workforce, and STEM workforce issues, and women's service in leadership, both in the private and public sector. But what excites me most about the appointment of Margaret Anderson Kelleher is the experience she has leading in a time of change. And I trust that Margaret will bring creativity, innovation, and forward thinking initiatives to our public works department. I trust that she will listen and lead on the issues that are most important to the residents we heard from today and to those throughout our city, including around the climate crisis that we are in and around our racial and equity goals. I believe that Margaret Anderson Kelleher is exactly who we need leading our city's public works department at this time. And I'm confident she will get the job done and show true results. So thank you for being here today and um, I appreciate all the questions that we've had and comments. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Koski. Council Member Chaktai. Thank you, um, Chair Johnson. I uh, also want to just join in, in thanking you, Commissioner Kelleher, for, for coming in today um, and uh, like such a thoughtful presentation. I saw so many people um, from the community come in and testify today, many of whom were Ward 10 residents. Um, and as I told you in our conversations, this is an issue that the community I represent cares very deeply about um, because we are we are so severely affected by it, like, um, like many others. Um, I have a set of questions for you. Um, so in 2020, the city of Minneapolis 
uh, formally adopted our, our transportation action plan. Um, and I was really thrilled to hear your commitment uh, to this in your remarks um, earlier today. Um, the piece I'm hoping you'll speak specifically to is the plan includes a goal for three out of um, every five trips in Minneapolis um, be completed by, by walking, biking, or taking transit, and that this is done um, by 2030, which is now only eight years away. Um, are you committed to completing this plan and abiding by the 2030 uh, timeline? And I wonder if you could speak uh, briefly to how you see us accomplishing that in the next eight years. Well, it is going to be, Mr. Chair, uh, Council Member Chugtai, it is going to be a big lift, but it's one that I'm committed to. Uh, I think that it's actually one of the most important pieces of the Transportation Action Plan. There are a lot of items in the action plan in terms of individual actions and things we can do as a city, but actually mode shift is one of the most important. That along with electrification of our fleet and uh, the buses that Metro Transit runs provide for really that greenhouse gas reduction to be able to hit those goals. When I think about this, I think about um, a focus on the most vulnerable user first, that is the walker or roller. Uh, we know that that is the oldest form of transportation we have. Uh, and then after that, uh, the bicycle uh, actually led to paved roads. So we know that these uh, modes of transportation are going to be very important to being able to meet mode shifts. I think the that's where I, I think I already mentioned this, that we're also we're talking about infrastructure changes that prioritize people over vehicles and that I am very supportive of. I also think it's behavior change and that is frankly a place where I think council members, the mayor, other leaders in the city are going to be as important, if not more important than the director of public works. I am one human being uh, in a department, but really by leading those conversations where we talk about the actions that people can change. I will tell you that when I, when working at MnDOT with the Sustainable Transportation Action Committee stack, it got me thinking about my mode of transportation. And I already have been trying to change my own behaviors about those short trips, those trips under a mile. Can I walk it? Can I bike it? Can I take transit? And often the answer is yes. Uh, I personally own three bikes. I feel privileged and lucky in that way. Um, I'm looking forward to commuting to City Hall to meet my own personal goals of, of this. But I also think that we have to continue to invest in our transit system. It is very important. We are at a moment in time where transit ridership is very low and we need to have some creativity to be able to help our residents both feel safe, have good transit, as well as look at transit of the future. And you and I spoke a little bit about this, how there are uh, going to be new smaller vehicles available that, you know, it might not be the Met Council running those vehicles, but it might be some combination of the city and community groups that are uh, deploying small scale electric vehicles that can really get what what the larger metro transit system does not do well today and that is it still is a spoken hub system and trips across town and between places are harder to get so i have lots of ideas um they're my ideas but i think that um it's exciting to be thinking about how we are going to get that mode shift done in eight years yeah yeah i appreciate that um, I, again, was really excited to hear about uh, your um, 
uh, I don't know, uh, interest is not the right word here, but it escapes me, um, uh, around a municipal shoveling program, a sidewalk uh, snow and ice removal program. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in, um, I think it's great that you're thinking about starting this as a, as a pilot and studying the impact. Um, would you, um, would you be committed to advocating for some funding to start that um, in the 2023 budget? So Mr. Chair and Councilmember Chugtai, I think working with the mayor's office and working with all of you, identifying a source of money for that funding uh, is important because clearly it would need some resources behind it. And so yes, working with the staff as well. Um, since there was a good study on this, I think that there are probably people who I will be meeting who uh, have some ideas around where where we could possibly put that together. So yes. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, and then, um, so, you know, shifting gears just a, just a little bit here, um, you know, that we, we know now that uh, police enforcement in transportation uh, disproportionately affects our communities of color, um, specifically um, our, our Black, Indigenous, and um, immigrant, and especially undocumented um, residents. Um, and, you know, wanting to, uh, wanting to ensure that we are, are building um, a transportation system that doesn't continue to perpetuate this, um, you know, continued cycle of, of punishing people, of, of you know, um, entering people into our criminal justice system of incarceration of our black and brown community members. Um, I wonder if you would support working with, with our transit partners, um, you know, our Met Council and, and, and Metro Transit, um, in in shifting to a zero fare transit system and removing enforcement um, from our our um, public transportation system altogether, knowing that um, there is an endless list of people who um, you know have ended up ticketed, um, have ended up entering our criminal justice system for. Um, something as small as not being able to afford a uh, bus fare. Um, and then, you know, I'll just add in another layer here. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a first generation immigrant um, and grew up in a mixed status family. Minneapolis considers, uh, we, we are a sanctuary city and uh, we are home to uh, a large immigrant population. Many folks um, mm -hmm. here are, um, you know, in mixed status households or, or undocumented themselves. and. Um, you know, not being able to, to drive uh, and not having access to a driver's license being uh, prohibitive in, in being able to move from place to place. So um, the additional fear of, of enforcement within our public transportation system is yet another barrier to being able to move from place to place. So I just wonder if you could speak a little bit to, to this vision of zero fare transit um, and of removing enforcement um, from, from our public transportation system. So Mr. Chair and Council Member Chugtai, I, I very much enjoyed our conversation about these issues. And I actually went back and looked at what's happening in Boston right now on three of the MBTA lines. Uh, there's a six month pilot happening in Boston. Their council and mayor chose to use pandemic COVID relief funds to waive fares. Um, and so if the council and mayor could come to an agreement to pay the Metropolitan Council and Metro Transit for fares on uh, any line determined to be uh, a line to test this on, I, I absolutely. I mean, I think that that is a, a wonderful goal. It actually also probably helps with mode shift to get people back onto transit. So. I think that's really a policymaker question, though, about the funding and the priority for it. I am supportive of the idea, and I'm going to be looking very closely. Um, the city of Boston and the MBTA are doing a report in February 
on this work. There's also a few small hurdles uh, with the Federal Transit Administration on this sort of thing too that we would need to get through. But I I take it that if Boston is leading the way and a couple of others, we can maybe learn from that. On the issue of transit enforcement, uh, I've been a strong supporter of the work the Metropolitan Council is trying to do to reduce the type of infraction right now. It's a very high um, infraction that people would, in terms of their ticket, and it has to go to court. I, I think that they would like to move to a transit ambassador program, which is a much friendlier way, kind of like uh, the downtown improvement zone, the DID folks. It looks more like that. Um, and so I think that that's a strong possibility. Unfortunately, the legislature has not been willing to allow Metropolitan Transit to fully implement such a program and they don't have the ability to do it on their own. It does take a law change. And then to the issue of driver's licenses for all, I'm a strong supporter. I think that you kind of hinted a bit at that. Um, you know, the ability to have uh, whatever the status of the person is, be legally licensed in the state of Minnesota and therefore also carry insurance, uh, which is a protective measure for both the vehicle driver and others, as well as walkers, bikers and rollers is really important. And so I, I have been a strong supporter. I believe that has been part of the city platform at the legislature in the past, and I am I am supportive of those efforts. Um, I appreciate that. Um, you know, the the switching gears again. The transportation action plan calls for a you know 25% transit mode share by 2030. It's a big jump. Uh, ridership. Um, you know, some organizations uh, around the Twin Cities have have proposed that the city of Minneapolis provide green light signal priority um, for all significant regular transit um, uh, route lines in the city to speed those lines up um, and providing, you know, significant mileage for, for bus lanes on city streets in the same way that San Francisco, Chicago, Boston and other cities have done recently. One of those organizations um, Move Minnesota has a, a program that they're working on called, you know, Boost the Bus. Um, it's an effort to get signal priority um, and bus lanes on our high frequency transit routes. Um, and they've, you know, met with a majority of Hennepin and Ramsey County board members to discuss their support um, for, for this on county roads. They have, um, you know, worked, met with St. Paul's Public Works uh, Department. Um, and discuss that initiative there as well, as well as um, with leadership at Metro Transit. Um, and so, you know, the next step here really is bringing uh, the Minneapolis Public Works uh, director and leadership up to speed and, and convening um, a group of, of all of the, the governmental partners here um, in moving this forward. Um, this initiative is also gonna need someone from one of the jurisdictions to lead on getting it done. Um, so a couple of questions as a part of that, um, would you support such a measure in, in providing green light signal priority for, for Metro Transit buses? And then would you consider, uh, you know, taking on that leadership um, as, as the Public Works Director of Minneapolis? So Mr. Chair and Council Member Chugtai, I look forward to learning more about MOVE Minnesota's uh, proposal. I think that um, it's it's well founded that having signal prioritization is a very important uh, key transit advantage. And so working together and uh, MnDOT needs to be at the table too on this since the city actually uh, services all of the signals in Minneapolis that are actually MnDOT owned, but that does not mean we regulate uh, the timing always on those. So I think working together, we can make some real progress. I, I want to be careful about saying, raising my hand and saying, yes, I'll be the leader of this right now. Um, I am very interested in meeting uh, with MOVE and with others on this issue, learning more uh, 
building that coalition to be able to get signalized priority for transit? Yeah, um, I appreciate that. Um, both the 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 honesty and the um, eagerness to to take something like this on. Um, and then now moving to a specific Ward 10 project. Um, you heard about this a lot. You and I have discussed this in detail, the reconstruction of Hennepin Avenue South. Um, so for context and just stating this again for, for the public record, um, Hennepin Avenue was last reconstructed um, about 50 years ago. Um, and the, um, so which is why it's up for reconstruction again. And the, the way we reconstruct the street, right, it is going to last another 50 years. Uh, for context, I would be 74 um, when we would be reconstructing the street again. Um, and, you know, no one in my family actually has made it past 70. And so when I think about this project and its importance, um, I'm really talking about a project that is going to outlast my lifetime um, as the youngest council member ever elected in this city. And so that's something with that should be, I take that with a, a level of seriousness and gravity that I, I hope all of us do as well. Um, and so, you know, there are, um, there is a, you know, there's a staff proposal right now that has come after um, nearly, I think it's like 89 different community engagement um, events and thousands of comments um, that the city has received. Um, really one of the, and I, you know, uh, and tons of calls and emails and all the things that all the other council members here and the mayor's office I'm sure are receiving as well. 15,000 people live along this corridor, largely who um, are renters, who are working class residents. Um, we've seen, you know, economic studies in in other city uh, studies in other um, in other cities and other places where uh, we have increased um, access to to biking, um, made it easier for pedestrians, and increased transit along a, a commercial corridor to result in um, a, like a positive you know, revenue, it's it's good for business um, is, is the point I'm trying to make here. Um, and so I wonder, I'm gonna go through four questions. We'll take them one at a time. Um, do you support the, the staff's current proposal? So Mr. Chair and Council Member Chuck Dye, I have attended one of those 89 meetings, so I've not attended all of them. And I don't know every single thing about the staff putting together the plan. Overall, I think the staff did a very good job in meeting the goals of the Transportation Action Plan and the Climate Action Plan through this proposal. I do think that you and others are hearing from people who have some concerns, particularly about the issue of parking access. Parking access for particularly what I have heard and read is about small businesses. And so I do believe that there is a way to largely preserve the plan. I am myself, I do believe if you're going to have a bikeway, it should be as much as possible a protected bikeway. And if you are going to have transit advantage, it needs to be some sort of dedicated bus lane. I do think that we at this point with our lowest number of transit riders currently have some opportunity to take a look and phase into the 24 seven bus lanes. And that does not mean never and it doesn't mean 10 years from now, but I think there's an opportunity there to work together with the staff, with the community and others to give transit priority and preserve that transit priority, which is critical for helping ridership rebound, but also looking at how are we going to make sure that many of the folks who are working in the gig economy through uh, food delivery and pickup are able to do that at the restaurants, as well as making sure that the small businesses have uh, 
time to transition their parking plans as well. So I, I look forward to working on this. I think it's a tough nut uh, issue uh, in terms of th this has come a long way. And so I'm respectful of the staff's work on the plan and look forward to hearing uh, what they are taking away at this point. But I, I think that overall we need to we need to uh, do a, just a, a little more work here. And then you you mentioned this a little bit, but uh, just again asking for clarification. Um, do you support the the dedicated two way uh, protected bike lanes? Um, Mr. Chair and Councilmember Chug Tai, overall as a policy matter, I am a strong supporter of dedicated bike lanes and bikeways, even separated bike lanes and bikeways, separated away from the traffic totally. Um, it is the safest way to ride. Uh, it is the way to help people make mode shift who can be biking. And so I am going to work very hard to preserve that portion of that plan. And just to make sure I'm understanding that correctly, you are you are overall you are a supporter of of um, protected bike lanes, and you are committed to preserving that in this current plan for Hennepin Avenue South. Mr. Chair and Councilmember Chugtai, I think that it is uh, the safest way to ride, and the most and the best way to commute. And so I think that. Uh, there's no doubt that if we're doing this reconstruction for the next 50 years, and by the way, let me just say, I hope you have a much longer life than 70 years old. Uh, I think, however, I will say I am approaching 54. I may not be around uh, at the end of this street's life, but I hope to goodness that it has uh, serve the people well in being able to do the mode shift and reduce greenhouse gases in the city. But one street alone won't do that. So we've got a lot of work to do. Um, and then do you support the uh, dedicated 24 seven bus lanes on Hennepin Avenue? So Mr. Chair and Council Member Chugtai, as we discussed, I think that we need to have uh, a conversation with our partners at Metro Transit about this issue, about what the ridership and needs are in the next projected five years. In fact, there's going to be a study done probably next year about the future of transit ridership uh, in the metropolitan area and across the state. I know that because we were actually at MnDOT asked to do that study, but the funding source was trunk highway dollars and we could not do it yet. I believe the legislature will appropriate the money to do that into the future. That is not going to stop our plans on Hennepin, but what it will help inform is the land use jobs and transit and transit opportunities of the future. And that's going to be critically important for any of this decision making. I think several speakers today talked about that we're in a unique time. And so with 24-7, I, I can tell you that I strongly support having the 24-7 bus dedicated lanes. I am not as certain that it's going to be needed on the day that the reconstruction of Hennepin Avenue opens because of we're going to need to climb back on ridership. So should it be uh, looking more like where the test was on Hennepin, that it was the rush hours, a long rush hour in the morning and a long rush hour in the evening, possibly with then a transition to the full-time 24-7 uh, dedicated busways. So I think that's a conversation with our partners at Metropolitan Council, frankly, as much as it is uh, only a Minneapolis question for it, because this is a ABRT line and we do need to fulfill its mission. Mm -hmm. No, I appreciate that. So, you know, um, I, I remember this was a specific piece you brought up with me as well, um, you know, and so I, I followed up on on um, on uh, ridership numbers and how that's been affected by the pandemic um, of, you know, Metro, Metro Transit buses. Um, 
Metro Transit Services have retained only 46% of pre-pandemic ridership. Um, by comparison, though, um, at the end of 2020, um, bus, uh, bus rapid transit in the Twin Cities retained 76% of pre-pandemic ridership. Um, and, and that number continues to climb. Um, so, you know, and I think this is a part of what re re reconfirms for me that it is, it is working class people, um, essential workers, um, who are, who use busing as their primary way of going from place to place. Um, it's not, you know, it's not people, um, it just, it's, it's, a, it's people who use public transit often do so not because it's a personal choice they're making. It's the only choice they have to get from place to place. Um, and then, you know, and I appreciate like wanting to wait for for to for the numbers to get back up, but we're really projecting four years into the future, right? So like this this plan wouldn't be complete for another four years, which would get us, you know, six years at post pandemic, um, post start of the pandemic. Um, and so I guess I'm I'm really trying to understand where this uh, appetite for you know, uh, tr like slowly get, wading into um, 24 seven dedicated bus lanes is, is coming from. So Mr. Chair and uh, Council Member Chugtai, I, I don't have an appetite to not have 24 seven bus lanes. But what I'm gonna tell you is that even on the A-line BRT, and I believe another of the BRT lines currently up and running today, they do not have 24 seven dedicated bus lanes. They have rush hour dedication with clear streets for them to be able to make their trips in either direction. It doesn't mean the bus stops running. It just means that there probably is a couple of minutes added to the trip in the non rush time. And that's how the A line has been run. That's how, and, and I, I don't want to misspeak about the other line, but I think we need to learn from what, and this is why it's a partnership question with Metro Transit. Metro Transit is already running these lines. They've been successful. That's where you're getting those retention numbers from. And those lines are not running 24 seven dedicated uh, bus lanes. No, I, I, I hear that. And then, you know, I, I guess I'm uh, the place where I feel just like a little bit stuck, right, is in order for us to meet our city's stated policy and our climate goals, we have to like we have to make it easier, more convenient, faster, cheaper to use other modes of of um, transportation, right, like other modes um, especially public transit, especially, you know, um, and then also strengthening our, our biking and pedestrian infrastructure so that it is actually cheaper, easier, faster, more convenient to, to use those options. We're, and so, and again, you know, we have this goal of, of reaching, reaching our, our, um, it was that 2030 piece we were talking about, right? Eight years away from now. Four years from now, when reconstruction of Hennepin Avenue is done, we're going to be only four years away from meeting needing to meet that 2030 goal. Yeah. And then we add in wanting to phase in 24/7 bus lanes, right? Like, I guess I'm trying to reconcile. Unless it's easier, unless it's more convenient, to to, and unless it's faster and more reliable to take public transit, that is not going to be the obvious option that people take, right? And then we know from cities where you know, 25% of the people use, uh, you know, other modes of transit, that the reason they've done that is because it's reliable and it's accessible and it's available all the time. We're, so, and I don't know if there's even really a question here. I guess I'm just trying to understand the back to the 24 hour, 24 seven protected mm -hmm. bus lane piece. Mr. Chair, I think that this is one of those issues that I am not the public works director yet. I do not know everything about the discussions with Metro Transit. 
I know that Council Member Chugtai and Council Member Goodman both have a lot of constituents who have concerns in both directions on this. Some who really want this project, others who have, at least I would say fairly reading the comments, concerns about particularly parking access. And so my commitment is to work on this issue. I'm bringing forward one idea that could be a possible idea. Maybe there are others that are out there. And in fact, I'm most certain there are. And so I'm looking forward to working on it. It's it's the very reason that I'm excited about this is this sort of problem solving. I appreciate that. That's the end of my questions. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chair and Commissioner Kelleher. Thank you, Council Member Chuck Tai. Are there any other council member questions or comments? I'm not seeing others in queue, so I have a couple of questions I will ask. Well, really one question, but first I want to thank the public for showing up to speak today and your questions and all your comments on uh, the consideration of this nominee. Uh, I also want to thank my committee members for their thoughtful questions and comments. And thank you, Commissioner, for all of your uh, thoughtful presentation and your answers as well. I appreciate you as well acknowledging the opportunities that some of my constituents made around water quality improvement. I'll note that before uh, becoming a member of the City Council, I made the false assumption that when everyone turns on their tap in Minneapolis, that they get nice, uh, clean, uh, cook, or nice, clear at least, uh, drinking water out of the tap. And uh, I was mistaken on that. There are some residents that do not, and when they turn on the tap, they actually get yellow or brown water uh, coming out. And I think that's something that we need to uh, have a plan to correct uh, in place. So I look forward to working with you on that. Another constituent did um, raise some questions uh, when speaking in support of you, if I remember correctly, just uh, to get your thoughts on uh, civil rights in general and workplace diversity. So. Um, if you wouldn't mind just speaking to how you approach those issues, uh, I would love to hear that. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I too uh, look forward to working with you on the water issue, uh, particularly on this issue of what sounds like uh, a very uh, rust embedded uh, delivery of water, and that can be uh, super, uh, not just inconvenient but upsetting and has uh, potentially health impacts as well. Um, I want to share, um, so one caller uh, talked about a project that they liken to Rondo that is not a MnDOT project, so I first want to say that. Um, uh, that's a Dakota County board project that's studying an interchange uh, down on Highway 52. MnDOT has a separate resurfacing project where they are working very successfully with uh, the Hmong American Farmers Association to not only do the project, but hopefully improve some access uh, for the Hoffa group to the highway, a safer, safer approaches and things like that, especially when driving a tractor across a highway which I will say I've had the experience of doing uh, several times in my life and it's not always very safe. So that I just want to clear up. I think that, um, you know, at MnDOT, the commitment is very strong to civil rights, both in terms of our incumbent workforce, but also our contracting workforce. Now there are challenges in highway heavy construction that are different than uh, the challenges in vertical construction. And so I wanna first acknowledge that particularly highway heavy construction, it has been a challenge across the country to both attract and retain uh, the type of contractor we need to meet those goals. That's female owned uh, ownership or minority ownership. And in Minnesota, we are particularly challenged with construction firms who do not meet those goals. Now, the exciting part of the city of Minneapolis is that you do a lot of your own work uh, internally. And that's where I think partnering on particularly uh, 
something like a union training center that would be in the city for uh, what we would call uh, road heavy work uh, is a great opportunity for us to do together. It's going to provide an option. Uh, maybe even we would partner with uh, Minneapolis Community and Technical College so that people get some AA credential and be able to have that as they move forward. I'm a strong supporter of us diversifying both our workforce and our contracting. Uh, you know, I have to get in there and learn a little more about how much control Public Works has over some of the other types of contracts we might be making. Those might be citywide contracts, but places where MnDOT has made particular advancements are things uh, in the area of small scale contracts, a program called Equity Select that we run where we actually are the leader uh, internally in the state in being able to utilize breaking large contracts into smaller contracts, helping and coaching uh, diverse contractors to be able to win those very contracts that we're putting out, and then being able to make sure that the contractors are growing their business. The, the idea there is to actually have those contractors graduate from the program where they are above a certain dollar cap amount. And so I'm looking forward to getting in there and learning about that. We've also had great success uh, working with our partners at Minute, uh, the IT organization of the state, to be able to uh, hire more diverse contractors in that area as well. And so I think there's many ways we can uh, uh, work on this, but I think one of the most exciting is those family supporting, wage supporting jobs that are in public works and working together, working with the high schools, uh, working with something like Minneapolis Community and Tech College to be able to put together with the unions a really great uh, training center. And that probably goes even beyond public works is my guess. Well, thank you. I really appreciate uh, that answer and, and all of your uh, commitment in this area. So uh, now I'll uh, say a few comments. So uh, I, I get the privilege to work with uh, new council members on this committee. So five of you, and I, I think I'm the only returning council member on this committee. Well, I know I am. And so uh, for those of you that are uh, new to this committee and who I'm uh, excited to be able to work with, and as well to the public watching, you know, uh, in my eight years on council, I've always taken these department head appointments very seriously. And I haven't always voted for every department head that's been nominated. And in fact, one of the reasons I wanted to be on the executive committee last term was because I think these are such important decisions uh, that we make. And that's why I'm really excited today about this nomination and uh, very excited uh, for Commissioner and Anderson Kelleher to be here with us. And uh, I have really enjoyed getting a chance to know you and want to really lift up how accessible and responsive you have been, uh, how you really take a collaborative approach in your work, your uh, thoughtfulness, and your remarkable record of public service. I also did my homework and talked to a number of other legislators uh, that have worked with you and heard time and again, uh, great things about the working relationship uh, that you have and the respect that they have for you. Um, you are proven as a uh, leader of organizations, including your ability to manage, which at the end of the day is the job of any department head. Uh, but in particular, I'm very excited about your high tech focus and background at a time where technology continues more and more. And even as we're on teams today, uh, having this meeting remotely continues to shape our work. There are opportunities absolutely within public works to improve service delivery, the quality of the results and uh, the equity of the results through technology. And I know you bring that expertise and competency and that data driven approach to this work. And I'm very excited about that. I also think one of your key strengths comes at a, a critically important time and that's policy leadership. And uh, after 
as I opened up this uh, this part of our meeting and uh, this consideration of this appointment, I mentioned this charter amendment, this government structure charter amendment. And so to have somebody at this time when we're all figuring out how to navigate this together, to have somebody who has a deep legislative background and commitment to working with the legislature and also works very closely with an executive in the governor today and knows how to bridge and navigate uh, that and work with everyone and all stakeholders, I think is really important in this time and in this moment we're in and can help us work through this as well. I also think that's important for this short term that we have. We have less than two years as a committee to work on policy matters and to have somebody with an expertise and a background steeped in legislative work. I'm really excited about that. I think that's a wonderful thing and will really help this committee as we approach our work. And as has been noted with the ARPA funding and all of our uh, intergovernmental opportunities before us as well around, bond uh, around bonding at a uh, time when the state has a record surplus and when we have a number of public works priorities over at the legislature, your deep relationships and your knowledge of the process and experience, I think will be a tremendous asset uh, for us as a city. But I also wanna recognize uh, and say one of the quiet parts out loud, which is that this is a time where our city has seen a number of department heads for one reason or another leave. And there's a lot of concern around that internally at City Hall. And for someone with your stature, with your remarkable history as the Speaker of the House, as a statewide commissioner, as I don't think this was mentioned yet, but a, a gubernatorial candidate backed by a major party, for you to step up in this moment when others are choosing to leave regardless of their reasons, for you to come to our city, to me that demonstrates leadership. And it demonstrates a commitment to our city at a time when we need that support. So I am proud today to support you and I am excited to get an opportunity to work with you and I hope uh, that this committee uh, supports your nomination. Thank you. I will ask if there are any other comments or questions from council members. I am not seeing any. So at this time, I'm going to ask the clerk to call the roll. Council member Payne. Aye. Council member Wansley Warlaba. Council member Bita. Aye. Council member Chuktai. Aye. Vice Chair Koski. Aye. Council member Wansley Warlaba. Chair Johnson. Aye. There are five ayes. Thank you, and that motion carries. I will also note that uh, Council Member Wansley Warbla, or, or sorry, Council Member Wansley Warlaba uh, was having some trouble uh, with the Teams meeting, it looks like, and was looking to uh, call in. So maybe we will give her just a moment here in case uh, she is interested or able to uh, vote on this. And so uh, maybe the clerk could uh, reach out to her as well and just confirm if we can get her on the call. But uh, in in the meantime, I want to say uh, congratulations. Oh, yes. Council member. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Um, yes, uh, I wanted to vote aye. Will the clerk note that? There are six ayes. Wonderful. Thank you and congratulations, Commissioner. This item will be moving on to the full council next Thursday, uh, the 10th at uh, 9.30 a.m. And before we adjourn our meeting, I know we have a request from council member Vita to uh, do to some also dial in again, the, the technology, we're working through it still. Uh, it, it, it can get complicated, internet can drop and all that. So uh, council member Vita, I know you were, uh, 
uh, working on getting connected during the consent agenda, but we're not able to. Do you have a request to be uh, noted on that? Yes, I would like to be noted as an I on the consent agenda, please. Excellent. I will direct the clerk to, reco uh, to record Councilmember Vita as voting aye, uh, if there are no objections from other committee members. Not seeing any, you will be recorded as an aye on that item. Well, thank you again to the public for coming and speaking. Thank you to the committee members. Thank you uh, to the clerks. And thank you to Commissioner Anderson Kelleher. With that, uh, we have concluded all business and our meeting is adjourned.